Uh, good evening, uh, ladies. Oh, uh, if there's a mustache, if you could wait just a few minutes, okay? If you could wait just a few minutes. Oh. We'll, we'll call you up. I told him to go up there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> mixed messages. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening and welcome to the Danvers Zoning Board of Appeals. We are now in session. Uh, I would ask um, that you uh, silence your uh, mobile phones or turn them off as, uh, so we're not disturbed this evening. I'd like to start by uh, announcing our um, zoning board members and uh, our administration uh, from the town hall. Uh, to my right is Bob Signetti, uh, Becky Kilborn, our clerk is uh, Ken Scholes, myself, John Bowner, as the chairman, uh, Jeff Sauer, these are our five regular voting members, and then our two alternates are Ken Jarinian and Corinne Doherty. Um, from the town, uh, from the uh, building and Department, our building inspector, Mr. Rich Maloney, and our uh, secretary, uh, Kathleen Archibald. Um, I'm going to start tonight. Uh, tonight's kind of a, uh, a happy and sad night, I guess, all at the same time. Uh, to my far right, Mr. Bob Signetti, um, who has been a zoning board member for about 27 years, I believe, uh, is retiring. This will be his last meeting tonight. Um, I. I would be remiss if I didn't say a few words about Bob, and um, I know the influence he's had on not only myself as a fellow zoning board meeting member, but um, you know just the service that he's done for the town of Danvers over these 27 years. Uh, Bob, you've been a you've been a great member of the community to volunteer your time in this way, and um, you know a lot of people may not know this about Bob, but he's also an excellent farmer, so it's great to get that. <laughs> tips uh, from Bob about growing and, uh, and things of this nature. So um, I know we'd like to present uh, Bob a, a small gift um, oh, from, from the board. <laughs> and we're embarrassing him a little, but uh, again, 27 years of helping the town, Bob. I don't think how we could uh, just let you go and walk out the door, so. And Bob, again, on behalf of the zoning oh, board of the town of Danvers, Thank you. We'd just like to thank you. <laughs> what a beautiful, beautiful. Film. I don't know if you should get that one, Muddy Bob. That one looks pretty good. <laughs> pretty oh, nice. I know. That's a beauty. Uh, I want to thank you very much. And. Uh, it's been my pleasure to serve on this board for the last 27 years, and I'm glad I'm going to walk out of here instead of go out feet first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bob, again, thank you, I and mean, I know I speak for everybody in the community. Uh, you know, your vision's been really great, and uh, we're really glad to have had all this help this, these years, but uh, sad to see you go as well. So. Um, he Thank might be extra honorary tonight just to get his last shots in, so we'll see. <laughs> uh, again, uh, so I'd like to move forward uh, with our meeting tonight. Uh, I will tell you we're, we're under mandate by the state to uh, not gather after 9.30 p.m. That poses a little bit of a problem for us tonight because we do have so many cases, so uh, we're going to try to move things along, but we will not start a case after 9.30. So. Uh, if we don't get to your case, uh, I'm going to go ahead and apologize ahead of time now, uh, but we will do our best to uh, complete everything. Again, uh, when the clerk calls your uh, case, if you could come up to the microphone, uh, present your case, the board will ask questions of you, uh, we'll go out to the audience for public comment, and then we will come back to the board to deliberate. Uh, we ask that you don't interrupt us at that point as uh, you'll just be able to hear, um, you know, kind of our thoughts. And uh, we'll give you your options from there on, uh, you know, depending on how the comments go uh, amongst the board. Uh, we will take a brief moment. Uh, Rich, do we have a separate mic for the public to speak tonight? We do, okay. So we'll take a couple of minutes in between cases just to wipe down microphones if need be. Um, so uh, you'll have to allow us that amount of time. Um, uh, board members, we were uh, sent minutes for our last meeting. If I could get a motion. So moved. Second. And a motion and second. Any further discussion uh, to accept our last minutes? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Okay, uh, and folks, we are on damaged cable, so uh, we ask that you speak clearly, remove your masks when you come to the microphone, uh, identify your name and address. Again, we're far away from you, so please, if um, you could be loud, if you're not loud enough, we'll let you know. And uh, with that said, we are going to skip on the continued uh, list down to 14 Brad Street Avenue first. We'll pick up the other continued cases from there, and then we will go to the top of the agenda. Did I get it all? You got it. Okay. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if we could start with 14 Brad Street. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our first case is Nicholas and Lisa Mustachio, docket 20-4895, requesting a variance to erect a, a cabana on existing slab. The is existing slab is 4.3 feet on the left side and 1.6 on the rear in accordance with Section 7, Table 2 of the Danvers Zoning Bylaws at 14 Brad Street Avenue. This is zoned R2. I think we're on receipt of a couple of letters. We are, Mr. Chairman. Our first letter that received is from the Department of Land Use and Community Services. The proposed work in the rear of 14 Brad Street Avenue does not require Conservation Commission approval as the work will be conducted on existing impervious surface and the work area is outside the 100-foot buffer zone to bordering vegetated wetlands, signed Georgia Prendergast. And the second le uh, letter is from the Code of Administration's office, uh, Richard Maloney's office. A site inspection was performed on December 7, 2020 to determine the adequacy of the existing slab for the proposed cabana. The slab is six feet thick and has been placed on a bed of crushed stone, pep, stressed stone pack, the building code allows accessory structures up to 400 square feet to not have frost protection foundation support. If the cabana is 400 square feet or less in area, the slab is more than adequate for this structure. Okay, and I just want to clarify, clarify it's not six feet, six inches thick. Did and I say six feet, sir? You did say six feet. Oh. <laughs> six inches. I'm six saying. inches. And uh, also, um, so uh, we were also in receipt of an adjusted uh, drawing that shows the setback of eight feet, not 1.6. Okay, so with that said, uh, we got what we asked for, it sounds like. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? Just, you know. We've been working with Rich. He's just, just announce your name again for the minute. Uh, I'm Nick, and this is Lisa Mustachio, 14 Bryce Street Ave. Okay. Um, so uh, I will uh, turn it over to the board, and Corinne will start down there with you. I do not have any questions. Thank you. And Ken? I don't have any questions either. Yeah. I don't have any questions, Mr. Chairman, no. Ken? No questions, thank you. Becky? Just for clarification, you're reducing the size of the structure from what you originally proposed of 576 square feet down to 400 square feet so that you can use the existing slab. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And Bob? I have no questions. And I, too, have no questions regarding this application. Is anyone here from the public? Uh, I'll take uh, right there. I can't see who you are, but I see a hand to the left. Mr. Bradstreet. Mr. Bradstreet. Interestingly enough. You make him sit up closer so you don't want to. Ironically. Yeah. Bill Bradstreet, town meeting member, precinct one. I live on Essex Street, not Bradstreet Ave. My question is I thought at a prior meeting it was discussed the fact the concrete slab was illegally constructed. Or was it? Uh, a question I asked you, once it's discovered that, it's e that it was illegally constructed, would it then someone, this board perhaps, have made the choice that the illegally constructed slab should have been removed? And if something needs to be built in that spot, then you start from square one. You get a permit, which I understand from the prior meeting, there wasn't a permit for that slab. You start with a permit then construct the slab, and then perhaps the cabana. Am I wrong? If I am, please tell me and I'll sit down. Uh, I'll go out to the building inspector for that, Rich, if you could address. Flat work, patio work does not need a permit. So, you know, if you want to pour concrete patios to your whole yard, there's no restrictions. 
to be not in the buffer zone of any sort. So in this case, the previous owner put, the, put that slab in, really wasn't a zoning violation until somebody wanted to put a structure on it. So these people inherited that. They called us up. We told them what they need to do to make that legal if they want to put a structure on it, and that's why they're before the board. Thank you. Thank you. Rich, too, if you could pull your mic a little closer because it's hard to hear you. Yeah, right here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Matthew Duggan, town meeting member, precinct one. I just want to start with a clarification, or you could clarify the set, the rear setback now. It sounded like it was different than what you had initially, what we had discussed at the last meeting. Yes, that's correct. We've been given an updated drawing that shows the setback at eight feet. Okay. Now. It was at 1.6. Okay. So that's a measurement from the street? That's a measurement from the rear lot. Okay. So I have a plot plan dated 1978. 160 feet is the depth of the lot. And I don't know exactly where that distance begins. I believe that Brad Street Avenue is 50 feet wide. So is that how it's measured from the front, from the street? Like, how do you determine what the rear setback is or the rear property line is? How is that determined? I'll go to Rich again on that. Yeah, this gentleman got a as-built of his property, which the surveyor lays out the whole property with the house, with the pool, with the slab on it. So we know exactly how it sits on the property. And through you, Mr. Chairman, how does that rear property line, how is that in relationship to the next, the property next door to the south, which is, I think, 16 Brad Street? Is it equal to the? You're talking about lot 37? That's where the 4.3 is? Well, it's actually on my plan. It's just called lot 7. But I believe it's 16 Brad Street. So the point I'm trying to make is that there's, I think, eight properties, all contiguous, and they all have the same rear line. They're all equal all the way across. Is that accurate to say? Well, that's kind of what we show on this as-built. So I would say, yeah. So it's difficult to get back there because of the fences and because of the, there's like a ditch further down to get access into that area. But from Google Maps, it looks like that rear line is much different than these other properties. So it looks like it's almost 190 feet back where the fences, there's a metal fence at the rear line. Was the slab measured from the fence? Or how does the fence equate to? Well, I don't. This fence is back here. This was the as-built from the surveyor locating the slab relative to the property. So this is back this way. All right. So in regards to the fence, the fence, I think we can all agree, is in the town-owned open space. Is that accurate to say? That City of Beverly? That's the City of Beverly property out back. I don't think the town of Danvers owns that land. I thought that that was owned by the town of Danvers. It's called 28 Brad Street Avenue. It's eight and a half acres. I have, if I may, Mr. Chairman, if I may show the building inspector. Yeah, sure. I think, again, Mr. Duggan, just to clarify. So, you know, we had asked the applicant to provide us information that what he was going to do was outside the 100-foot buffer zone for vegetated wetlands. I don't think the zoning board can speak to the property lines, you know, anything outside of what we've been given, which is an as-built site plan. Well, I think with other applications in the past, I've seen you as part of a 
a condition that you have the, uh, the fence that's uh, on uh, open um, space that it be moved uh, back onto the, the property in question. So that's, that's one of the, that would be a request uh, to the board is to make that a condition to move to move that fence out of the town on open space. Well, so uh, so uh, we're, we're saying there's a fence. Uh, you're saying that uh, this lot is more than 160 feet as shown? No, the previous owner put his fence out in past his property line. Okay. And this owner inherited that? That's correct. And your question, Mr. Duggan, is, is that fence or should that fence be moved? Yeah, it's not a question. I think it's a request that you uh, have that fence moved out of the town on property and back onto the applicant's property where it belongs. Okay. Um, in terms of the setbacks, uh, could you uh, just refresh my memory? What is the side setback with uh, the school? Uh, this is an R2. Uh, so this side setback should be, is it 15 or 20? <clears throat> 15 feet construction over 120 square feet. All right. Have we heard from the school about this application? Uh, we have not. They have been notified. All the about us have been notified. Have been notified. All right. So I noticed when I went out there, the school actually is in violation. They have two structures right on their property line. So it's probably yeah. doubtful that they will. Yeah, but we're, we're here on this case, okay, not the good. school. All so. right. So what, what variances are uh, in play here? What, what's being requested? Is it side and the rear? Yes. That, that is correct. There's a variance to, um, yeah, for the, for the left side setback in the rear, but I don't believe the rear is an issue anymore because now it's, All right. uh, sorry, it is, sorry. And just one last comment uh, concerning the size, even though it's being reduced down to 400 square feet, <clears throat> it's still uh, 14 feet high. It's still a considerable size for the intended use. And, uh, you know, it's a school today. I heard a comment at the last, uh, at the beginning of the public hearing last time, and, it's, uh, and uh, the comment was that uh, no, one, no one lives there. There's no one there on weekends, so it's not the impact uh, to the to that property is uh, insignificant, but you know we don't know what it's going to look like uh, years from now. This variance is forever in perpetuity, right. and so um, you know we've seen examples in the past. Uh, one that you just debated last time that uh, you know you look at you look at the <coughs> use has changed over time, and this is a potential negative impact on uh, on that property. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Any additional comments from the public? Uh, hearing and seeing none, um, we will come back to the board and deliberate, and we'll start down there with you, Corinne. I think, I think the prior owner, um, you know, did a lot of things that they shouldn't have done, um, but you're now the owner, and um, I, would, I would vote to allow you to put the cabana house up. You're in favor. Yes. Uh, Ken. Yeah, so you, you've uh, met all the conditions we, we've asked of you from the last meeting. I, I would vote for this. Thank you, Ken and Joe. I will vote for this. Won't or will? Will. Will. Thank you. Ken? I have no problem with this. I'll vote for it. Thank you. I'll vote for this. Thank you, Becky. Bob? Wow. Um, I will vote for this as revised. Uh, I, too, support this. I, I think the owner is uh, here trying to do the right thing, unlike the prior owner. Uh, we did get information from both the um, uh, planning department or conservation department, and, uh, you know, the slab was checked to see, um, you know, if it could handle this kind of structure. Uh, but before I make this official, Rich, if you could just enlighten me. so. I know our auxiliary use structures are limited um, by square footage, but are, we, are they also limited by height? Uh, no, the height, the height is measured to the midpoint of a gable roof. So in fact, this is... Um, and, but what, so is there, a, um, 
Is there a zoning bylaw on this height of an auxiliary use structure? Or is it just a well, square it would be, footage? Are, are you, on a structure over 120 square feet, like a garage, it can be 30 feet the same height as a okay. house. So in this, but we measure the roof height as defined in the bylaw. It's the midpoint of the gable. So, so if this is at 14 feet, so the midpoint of this would be, what, 12 or something? 11, I think. 11, okay. Okay, I, I too would vote for this as, uh, as Bob pointed with the uh, amended uh, setback of eight feet from the rear. <coughs> uh, I just want to double check with the board. We're all good on the location of this existing fence. Whoever owns that property should ask for the fence. Okay. Team. Okay, uh, if I could get a motion, please. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, grant the dimensional variance from Section 7, Table 2 of the Town of Danvers Bylaw to erect a cabana uh, no more than 400 square feet on an existing slab uh, four foot by three inches from left side property line and eight feet from the rear property line per the plan submitted, the revised plan submitted, uh, the hardship is the shape of the lot. I've got a motion. I'll I, second. I got a second. Is uh, there any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. See the building inspector. Thank you. <coughs> Kathleen, are you Mike Lady? You are. Okay. Okay, folks, we're going to go to the top of our uh, continued cases now. <coughs> Our next case is JHR Development LLC, docket 20-4883, requesting a variance to allow a portion of the property to be used for multifamily residential purposes and a finding to allow the alteration of the existing non-conforming parking setback and landscaping setback to decrease the non-conformity by increasing the parking setback and the landscaping buffer over existing conditions in accordance with Table 3, se Section 3 of the Danvers Zoning Bylaws at 51 Needham Road. And this is Zone C3. Attorney McCann, if you could just make sure that mic's straight where we can all hear you. The acoustics are kind of tough up here, and knowing you're going to be up there for a while, we're a few cases. If you're gonna stay. Okay, hopefully you can hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good. You're going right. to stay with your mask? I am, if you okay, don't so mind, sir. Just bring sir. that as close as you can. I will. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nancy McCann. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, JHR uh, Development, LLC. Uh, the applicant, Hillary Rocket, is here this evening. Also with me tonight is Michael Wang, the project architect, as well as Larry Beals, the project engineer. Um, we've met with you a couple of times already on this project, and we've had two uh, very complete uh, hearings. Uh, previously, and at the end of our last hearing, which was the beginning of November, um, we had gone through a board comments, and specifically the chair, as, as well as a couple of other members, asked us to take a look at density, take a look at uh, the massing of the buildings, take a look at whether we could increase landscaping. 
And in fact, we have uh, been able to do that. So we got to work after that last meeting and specifically Michael Wang, our project architect, got to work and he spent a great deal of time um, trying to address the, the comments that you had and I think we've done a, a very good job of doing that. And we submitted to you that you hopefully will have in your packages tonight revised plans that make some very significant changes uh, to address those comments. And in doing so, we've come up with a revised um, project and a revised plan uh, that we're very excited about. We think it's a very nice looking design and I think it, it addresses the comments that we heard. So specifically, uh, the revised plans, uh, I'm going to go through the changes that were outlined in the, in the cover letter that I submitted to you, but specifically, the number of units have been decreased from 140 units to 130 units. So that's a 10 unit reduction. The building square footage, the total square footage of building has been reduced by 8,400 square feet. That's a, a very significant reduction in building square footage. The footprint has also been, uh, been reduced in size for each of the two buildings. And by doing that, uh, reducing the footprint, well, we're able to increase the landscaping. We've also been able to increase the landscaping by reducing the number of parking spaces required. We've reduced the number of units by 10 units. That means we reduced the number of required parking by 20 parking spaces. So we pick up green space both in decreasing the size of the building and decreasing the number of parking spaces that we need. The impervious surface area, while we had intended to reduce the impervious surface area originally over existing conditions, because as you know, this site is currently 94% impervious. We've been able to reduce it further, again, by adding the green space. So uh, we are now at 71% impervious. That's almost a 25% reduction <coughs> over existing conditions. That's an, a significant change to this site uh, that will make it uh, more attractive, more environmentally uh, friendly as well. We've also, and it, Michael can speak to this if you have any questions, but you can see it on the plans that we submitted to you. Um, the massing of the buildings, we've been able to decrease the massing, and by that I mean the appearance of the buildings, uh, by creating a green space common area on the roof uh, section. And you see that here and here. So we've created, this is common area, green space that will be open to all of the residents, um, that breaks up the massing of the building, creates more community space, um, that we talked about during our, our prior hearings and, uh, and create some nice amenity areas. Um, so these revisions to the plans are significant. I hope that you've, you find that they are significant. They certainly address the comments uh, that you have made uh, and allow us to proceed forward with a project that's uh, viable, that will provide needed housing in this area um, that will allow residents to move into the area that will support the businesses and the, and the other services that are in this area. And it's, a, and it's an attractive place uh, to live given the employment opportunities, given the services and the, uh, and the com uh, commuting uh, systems that are in place that we discussed at the, at the prior meetings. Um, so that, uh, that's what we were able to do. We think those are significant changes, and we would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Attorney McCann. Um, why don't we start down there with you, Bob? Are we still at 12.5% uh, affordable? We are. OK. Are you buying this land or leasing it? This is a ground lease. This is a, a portion of a very much larger piece that's uh, about 24, 25 acres. It's so about a four long, and a half how, acres. How long is the lease? It's, Hillary? 60 year. 60 year lease. Okay, so we can assume then the affordable housing is going to be there for 50 years. The affordable housing we would assume as most affordable housing components in Danvers are, are in perpetuity. 
Okay. Well, well perpetuity is 50 years here, right? Mm -hmm. Well, it would run with the permit. That's, we're talking about the lease. The lease uh, all would have extension provisions as well. The, the lease provisions are separate from the zoning provisions that would be put in place, and we would accept a condition that the affordable component is in, in, in perpetuity. Okay. Next question, that sign on 128, hmm? do you intend to use that? Yes, I, we made a presentation on the sign at the last meeting. We were reducing the sign by Michael. Uh, so reducing it by 75%. Why, why do you need that sign? <clears throat> to identify the development. They, uh, most residential developments, all that I'm familiar with, have, have signage. Wait a minute. Now, that's a commercial sign. You want to change commercial property to residential property. But you're not willing to give up the commercial sign. I'm talking about the one on 128 to identify the place. You're already by the place by the time you can see that sign. You need a sign on Endicott Street. You need a sign on the building, like every other apartment complex in town. I'm going to show you the graphic that. I don't see why you need a sign on 128. It's a commercial sign, and you're a resident. Well, it's, it, it's changed from what the commercial sign is now by making it 75% smaller than what is, what well, is the there. The location makes it a commercial sign. But as you, these are apartments that are going to be for rent. And as you drive down 128, you will see this apartment complex. It would be nice to know and important to know both for marketing as well as for folks who might want to live here to know the name of it because you, you can't, and this is part of the uniqueness of this site that we talked about, you don't see the entrance, you don't see this building from the entrance on Endicott Street. You would have no, you're driving down 128, you see this beautiful development with this nice roof deck and you say, hey, I'd like to live there. Well, how do you find it? You don't even know the name of it. If this were not commercial property, this was residential property, and you could put up this building by right, you would not have a sign on 128. Am I correct? Oh, you would absolutely have a sign. How could you get a, a two signs? Do you have to have two signs? One on Endicott Street and one on 128? What I'm getting at is you want to do away with the commercialization of this property, mm -hmm. but yet you want to keep the commercial sign. I don't see a need for this a sign on 128. You need one on Endicott Street, the entrance. You need one on the building to identify the building. You know, I, I think it's really overkill to have this sign on 128. I have no other questions. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Becky. Mm -hmm. do we don't propose a building up? mounted sign, though. We don't have a building sign. Well, you should have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You should have. You should have a sign at the entrance and a sign on the building. Not a big commercial sign on 128. <laughs> He's going to be McGann, talking. You, it's his uh, last uh, night. It's, you know. <laughs> going out with a bank. Get, just get, get, get it all out. Get that, so, okay. Attorney McCann, do you yes. get a uh, respond to that uh, request? Um, uh, the applicant is hearing uh, is hearing this and uh, and I'll ask him to comment on it uh, the response that we heard when we discussed this though originally was that's a huge grandfathered sign out there we've reduced it by 75 percent down to be in keeping with what a sign you would typically see this well, is I not think unusual. we all understand that you've conceded on the side yeah. but I think to mr. Signetti's point this is a commercial sign and you're asking for residential use, and you're asking for a commercial sign as well. So I think Mr. Signetti's saying, give up the commercial sign. Maybe go with one on the building. So I guess I'm just All right, well, let us think about that. Okay. Uh, Becky. Okay, so I, w I just want to go back to some of the discussions that we had about the electric, electric being available in that mm -hmm. area, the water being available in that area. Do you anticipate that you would have to come back to us at any point and reduce the size of the project based on the fact that there may be limited utilities in that area? Absolutely not. There, were, there was nothing in our meeting that we had with the planning staff 
okay. uh, that led us to believe that the utilities are not available. Uh, well, they we are. Have a memo that says the utilities aren't available. So. Oh, I don't think the memo says that the utilities aren't available. They they are available, um, and it doesn't impact the design. I don't anticipate that we would have to come back. It may be a cost for the applicant uh, when you start doing the engineering that co goes into site plan approval. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't anticipate, and there so, was nothing so that came out of that meeting that we had, the technical review meeting, that would lead us to believe that we would have to reduce the number of units. Okay, I mean, it says in this memo, adequate water service is unclear. It will be clear once we do the technical work um, for site plan approval. Okay, so, so whatever you have to do to make it available, you, you feel you'll be able to do? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and, Attorney McCann, just to that point, the memo also states that uh, the electric division is concerned uh, about the potential load. So, same situation. Same thing. That's a, that's, that is a... A typical type of comment that we hear at this stage because we have to, that comes up in site plan approval. Utility capacity comes up during site plan approval when the engineering is done. Michael, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, so again, I'm Michael Wang. I'm the architect of with Foreign Place in Newton. Um, so I think what we've learned from our conversation with the staff is that there are multiple approaches to dealing with utilities on the site, and one of them had to do with uh, how accessible gas line was. Uh, and so if that is a reasonable approach, is tapping into the gas, that would solve a lot of the loads that need to be put on electrical. If not, there will just be another approach or there will be an adjustment to the, to the program. So it okay. seems like there's a lot to be discovered. And I'm that just typically referring happens to the memo dated o October right, right. 30th from Aaron Henry. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I mean, it, it's difficult to say, yes, go ahead, do this project, when we don't know that the town could support it utility-wise, and mean, there are many other issues, but... And that's why we go through site plan approval. That, that all gets fleshed out with every project that you approve. We get to site plan approval, and there are changes that uh, we might either need to make, not necessarily that impact the project, but impact what the applicant might see as what the utilities, how the utilities might come in. Well, we need to, to do this a little bit differently, but it doesn't affect the uh, layout of the project that you are approving. Okay. Um, it, it's just the technical, it's the next level. And we have to get through this level first, then we move on to site plan approval. And we had the technical review meeting at the request of this board uh, to find out if there were any showstoppers. And there were none of those. It's just a question of when we figure it out uh, from a technical standpoint, how there are different ways to skin the cat. There's different ways of doing it, and there are costs associated with those. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, as ref according to the soil on the site, I know, is that also in planning? When they're going to, they, you know, because it did about a tannering site, tanning site. We've had a phase one and a phase two. Uh, site assessment done, which we discussed at the last meeting. And uh, there was the small, we had our LSP at the last meeting, as you know. Um, and there was a small area that is not going to be disturbed and doesn't need to be disturbed for the development as it's shown. Very small area in. I remember them saying that area. Uh, so there isn't any additional soil work in that regard. The phase one and the phase two have been completed. Uh, there is soil work done in the normal course of a site plan preparation, That's which right has now. to do with stormwater management okay. and infiltration. Right, where we're near the river, too. Um, I guess that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And I'll remind the uh, rest of the members questions, please, and I have no comments at this point. Questions? I have no questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ken. Questions? Did you consider um, how we, we a lot of members, especially, well, me included, we were concerned about the height. Did, did you um, consider making the height of the building less? Um, I'll ask uh, Michael can address that the height, however, is compliant with the zoning district? Yeah, for commercial, right? But 
not for residential with the the amount of land you have per the unit i believe right it's, am i yeah so again you're trying to you want your cake and eat it too double dipping or whatever you want to call it but it's like you're trying to yeah play both sides here it's like that it's very tall i was just wondering if you considered yeah. nine i know you took out, out 10 units but you didn't like take off a floor so those units you like they're scattered around i don't know where right well let me respond by saying two things first of all um, in terms of the size of the building i i personally believe that it is not um out of scale with the site i mean in fact uh, per the zoning you can do uh, 50 percent um, you know, building coverage on the site. And I grant, granted that's, you know, like commercial, like you said, but we're only doing about a little over 15%. So it's less than a third of the allowable site coverage. But with respect to the height, let me just tell you that we looked, coming out of the last meeting, we looked at three different alternatives for how to reduce uh, when we decided to reduce the unit count. One was to shrink the footprint of both buildings substantially, um, and that didn't address the height. Um, and the other was to remove portions of the top floor in both buildings, uh, from both ends of the buildings. And that had a pretty dramatic effect, but it didn't reduce the footprint of the building. You see there's a bit of a push and pull there. So what we decided to do ultimately was to find a compromise position where we reduced the footprints of each building by 10 feet in length. And we've carved out these um, terrace areas on the on the top floor, and I think what's most notable about these terrace areas, it's in the area where the two buildings get closest together. And so essentially, what was before perceived as one large block, potentially, this allows the two buildings to be sort of separated visually, and I think that really would help with the scale of the building as well. So that was the compromise that we decided to do, and as a result of that, we not only have some reduction in the sense of the massing of the building, but we have over 5,000 square feet of new green space on the site. So what is the setback from the highway? The same? Yes. Right. Yes, the setback from the highway hasn't changed. Okay. We're, we're about two and a half times the distance of the setback that is needed from the highway. So. For commercial. I have no other question. Thank you, Ken. Karen. Um, I actually have a question for the building inspector. Sure, go ahead. Um, I, was, I was discussing this project with um, someone affiliated with Town Hall, and they told me that the projection for the water um, supply for the town um, isn't looking good for the next few years, and that not only would a project like this not really be sustainable for the town, um, but two projects, this one and the one on Endicott, would kind of um, throw the town um, into kind of like a, a desperate need. Um, is that something that you've heard? And how is the town planning um, to, I guess, um, fill the shortfall? Uh, I, I didn't hear anything like that. I know at the Technical Review Committee, all those issues are brought up between D DPW, water sewer, um, electric light, so I just heard that there was, like they, like they presented, that gas, if, if there's gas service, then that reduces the electric load. If they can't get gas, then they're talking about bringing in some uh, more power from, it's not that they can't get it there as a cost, like they said. I didn't hear anything that said, there was no, nothing that came out of that TRC that said, oh no, we can't build these units because of water. So I did not hear that. Okay, thank you. No further questions. Thank you, Karen. So, Attorney McCann, uh, I'd, I'd like to deal with numbers, so um, refresh my memory. Uh, Hollywood Hits current height, building height, is 24 feet? It's 23. And what's the proposed height of this uh, structure? 23 feet uh, is the existing and 42, is that correct, Michael? 42 feet proposed. And that 42 feet to Mr. Gervinian's point, uh, that has not been reduced, correct? Uh, it has been reduced in two um, visible, prominent, I would call it, sections of the building. So yes, it has been reduced in two sections of the building, down to 31 so, feet. So those areas of the building taper down from 42. 
but just lower. The whole building's lower? The whole no. building is lower in these two sections. It's down a whole floor. Uh, just, so just it's down to 31 feet. And second. that's the massing you talk about, that you cut out? Right. Okay, so in between the two structures, we've kind of softened the look by bringing it down to 32. Right, so they feel less like one building, and they have this separation visually. And did the space between those two buildings also increase, or it's the same space, it's just a softened look? Uh, it's the same space at the moment. It's, you know, there's over 30 feet between the two buildings, and then the areas that are cut back are about 40 feet each, so, you know, the four-story aspects of it are, you know, over 100 feet apart from each other now. And again, staying with the massing for a second here. So uh, the reduction was, I guess, to the north side, correct? Where those, that's where we reduced units. Well, it's actually uh, the south side. It's, it's the side closest to Russo. Um, yeah. All right, closest to what? On the left-hand side. Right, 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 right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, my other question is, uh, and you pointed this out. So if this were to pass zoning board approval, um, and then you mentioned about these other things that kind of get ferreted out uh, through site plan approval, um, what happens, or, or have we had an instance where this board passes it and you can't uh, come up with a solution with site plan? For instance, Mr. Maloney mentioned, okay, we don't think we can supply a large enough gas line in there, then, then that changes the electrical load. So you guys pay to put in a substation to address that, and that's how we solve that problem? Or the town does that? Oh, the, the developer does that. The all right. Yes. And so are, you're asking me, has there ever been uh, a case where, that I know of, that a bo this board has approved it and then we move on to site plan and it becomes impossible to do for a technical reason. I cannot think of that. I can think of cases where the technical fix was more expensive than the applicant anticipated it would be. Sure, sure. But it didn't provide. So, so expand on that a project. little bit. Give me a for instance. What, what had to happen? Oh, I'll give you an, I'll give you an example. For example, uh, water pressure for emergency fire flow wasn't high enough, so a booster had to be put in, a water booster station. Okay. Okay. That it, engineering things are it tend to be no. It, it doesn't tend to be a situation where it's no, you can't do it. It's how do you do it and how, how do much solve? does it cost? Okay. So I think I get it with gas and electric. You're mm -hmm. playing a game between which master are we going to serve, what makes mess, uh, most economical sense. But how do we deal with water? Uh, I, I get the booster part, but I'm just talking water in general. How, do, how does a project of this size uh, get estimated in site review by the town on its need? And I, I guess just explain that a little to me. Because I'm, I'm just trying to understand for my own benefit here and not wanting to send something on, as Corinna has pointed out, that, geez, maybe the town's really going to struggle with the supply. Mm -hmm. um, again, we haven't heard that situation that there isn't enough water for this project. We didn't hear that at all uh, from the technical review. Oh, uh, again, I, but how, so how is that determined? Oh, the water department and the standards of gallons per bedroom that's established so by the state. So there's a spec of ga uh, gallons per bedroom. 110 gallons per day per bedroom. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that and the project good. engineer will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, before I go out to the public, <laughs> any uh, board members have additional questions? Yeah, I can. I do. So you mentioned um, that there will be a roof deck. So how high will the fence be on the top? And what, uh, what else will you have on top of the the roof, which will make it higher? Well, uh, we've looked at a number of different things there. I mean, the, the, the railing will have to be a guardrail, so it'll be a 42-inch high railing. Um, there may be planters, there may be small pergolas or things like that, but if that's something that is deemed not desirable, 
uh, we can sort of adjust that as you know as we go through the site plan and process. So there'll be any mechanical up on the roof, any chillers, any of this, these types of things. Not not in that area for sure. So yeah. 42 feet, and then maybe this 42 inch uh, railing. Yeah. Oh well. Well, the railing, uh, the 42-inch high railing, is at the lower uh, roof deck area, so that would be above the 31-foot height. Okay, so, so nothing on top of it. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Yeah, does that answer? Yes. Any thank additional you. questions? Uh, yep. Verify go numbers on the. Just um, going. To, you use one set of numbers, and then I'm looking at the two plans. So uh, the number of units, the studios have gone from 38 to 40. <coughs> Uh, the one yes. bedrooms from 62 units to 44. Yes. And there's the, been a slight there's been a slight adjustment in the percentages of the units, and that was in order to, because as you can imagine, when you're trying to reduce the footprint of the both buildings as well as remove units on the roof, there has to be some rejiggering of the unit layout. Okay. Um, so that's that's simply just to accommodate. I'm just trying to verify, yeah. you know, just for our own. Yep. So the, the studios went from 38 units to 40, so we have two more studios. The one bedrooms went from 62 units to 44 units, right. so a lot less one bedrooms. And the two bedrooms went from 40 units to 46. Does that sound right? That does sound right, yes. So okay. they're, they're all roughly in the, the 30 to 35 percent range for those three t unit types. Okay, and the size of the units? Has the size of the units has remained the same as presented originally. Yep. Okay. Um, right, so the, the studios are about 550 on average. The one bedroom is about 715 square feet on average, and the two bedroom typical unit is 888. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. All set, mm -hmm. Any additional questions from the zoning board? None. I will go out to the public. If you could please raise your hand and come to the microphone, Mr. Bradstreet. Again, Bill Bradstreet, Tommy, meeting member, Precinct 1. At a prior meeting, I thought was one of the subjects that was discussed was the contamination soil on the site. <clears throat> Memory serves me correctly, and I'm old, that the inspection was done by the developer, not by the state abrogating its duty. It wasn't discussed tonight. Why is the state not doing the inspection if that's what took place? as opposed to the developer checking the ground for contamination. I, I'm just looking for clarification. Yeah. Attorney this. McCann, you want to respond to that? Sure. Uh, how a uh, site inspection when, there, when contamination is expected or anticipated or being looked for, it's not done by the developer. It is done by an LSP, a licensed site professional. And that was who we had here at the last yeah, meeting. meeting. And the LSP is licensed by the state and acts as the state He's inspector. An agent of the state. Yes, I got it. and he answers to the state, uh, and it's a third party that we hire as the developer um, to pay for doing that inspection. But the way the state regulations work for environmental investigation is that an LSP does that. The state, quote unquote, doesn't do the inspections. An LSP that's been licensed by the state does those inspections. Okay, thank you. Does that answer it for you, Mr. Brassery? Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. And further clarification, and I think I have this right, <coughs> your plan is to not disturb, or disturb that location, therefore encapsulating it is the term I learned. Yes. And that is what uh, keeps the arsenic, et cetera, from, uh, I guess, further contaminating or, or spreading. Good luck. We're all getting good at this. Uh, additional questions or comments from the public? Uh, we'll go right here in the front. Yep, right to the mic. No one chance, uh, 47 Needham Road. Yeah, if you just come a little closer so we can hear you. Sure. Thank you. Can you hear me better now? A little bit. 
How about now? Yeah. I just want to read this brief statement. This four acres exhibits no hardship. The four acres is a C3 zone portion of a 24 acre parcel located within the R1 and C3 districts. I can take this off. Access to the larger parcel and to the four acres is via a driveway from Endicott Street, which passes through the R1 zone between parcels in single and two family use that were constructed long before the 24 acres was rezoned multiple times, each allowing more intense use. Importantly, the four acres is level and rectangle shaped and although it is distant from the larger parcel's light-controlled access point at Endicott Street, it has more than 300 feet of frontage along Route 128, whose average traffic count is 79,500 vehicles per day. Just west at the access to the Market Basket Anchored Center, Endicott Street exhibits a traffic volume of 21,600 vehicles per day. Overall, the four acres has adequate access and good exposure to traffic, making it a destination commercial site. In support of this opinion, I will point out that the abutting portions of the 24 acres are improved with retail, BJ's, commercial, Marine Max, and office and light industrial use buildings that are fully occupied. The C3 zone allows a broad array of uses by right, and it seems that redevelopment of the four acres could occur in a less intense use than is proposed. Then why make the case for seeking such an extraordinary divergence from zoning? I believe the answer is in order to increase the return to the land. In other words, more profit to the landowner. Earlier, at the pre previous meeting, you heard an explanation on behalf of the applicant that it was the economic feasibility that required then 140 units. And I suggest that the economic feasibility can occur under uses allowed by zoning or with a lesser variance if the land price is lower. In essence, the Zoning Board of Appeals is being asked to dispense with zoning in order to allow the applicant to pay a land price that is only feasible with a use variance, allowing a density that will create a hardship for the abutters to the larger parcel. The abutters have already borne the brunt of blasting during the site's original development and multiple changes in zoning that change the residential character of the neighborhood, including the attendant increases in traffic volume. I will also point out that the applicant's traffic study did not explain that when the theater was in operation, it was primarily on weekend evenings and just when the theater was emptying that the traffic volume was heavy. Now, this proposed use creates a high traffic volume 24-7. Furthermore, the traffic study mentions the neg negligible impact from conversion of four or five family dwellings located some distance away, while not mentioning the multiple acre site at the former Denny's that is also proposed for a large number of multifamily units, and the multiple acre portion of the former Sylvania parcel located diagonally opposite this larger parcel's access point at Endicott Street. The reasonably expected eventual use of this latter parcel will contribute additional traffic at this parcel's access point from Endicott Street. Lastly, the traffic study barely mentions Needham Road, a private way that is crossed by the four acres driveway which provides two additional access points to Endicott Street. I'd like the board to be aware that currently, when there is a red light at the 24-acre parcels Endicott Street access, 
vehicles sometimes use Needham Road to bypass that light. Introducing 130 units now of housing whose occupants will commute to work by automobiles will likely increase use of Needham Road as an alternate access. I'd like you to try driving Needham Road. It's about 12 feet wide at some points. The road is too narrow for a safe increase in traffic, and the traffic study makes no mention of this likelihood. In summary, I ask the board to consider the history of the larger parcel, the likely demand for the four acres from less intense uses, and the precedent they will be setting if they approve this variance as, in my opinion, the extent of the variance far exceeds the need for a parcel which truly does not exhibit a hardship. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comment? Yep. Mm -hmm. Doug, if you just wait one second, we'll wipe that down. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Matthew Duggan, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 1. Um, that's going to be a tough act to follow. He was uh, quite eloquent in his comments. Um, just again to uh, this hearing, it's to request a variance, and that is specifically to allow residential in a commercial zone that's not allowed by right. Is that accurate? That is correct. We're uh, here to allow a portion of the property to be used for multifamily resident purposes as the variance is also a request for a finding to allow alteration of existing non-conforming parking setback and associated landscaping uh, and to, to decrease the non-conformity by increasing the parking setback and landscaping buffer. Okay, thank you for the clarification. So while this may be an appropriate uh, Form uh, to, to request that uh, variance from the ZBA, I would argue that it's really uh, within the realm of, uh, of town meeting. So 21,000 voters, through their duly elected representatives at town meeting, have uh, voted and decided that they don't want this type of development in a commercial zone. And if they did, then it would be allowed by right, and we would not be discussing this. Um, so I, I would ask you that you keep that in mind. Uh, we've, uh, I mentioned this at the last meeting, that we did uh, town meeting approved similar uh, uh, changes to uh, allow residential and industrial one along the high street corridor. So this is something similar. Um, these developments are very uh, impactful. Uh, not only to that surrounding area, but to the, to the town in, in general. And um, earlier I heard comments concerning the water use. Um, there's a number of impacts to the town's infrastructure that ratepayers may be forced to cover. So uh, to the water, um, I don't believe Danvers has a water supply problem. They have a uh, storage problem. And that becomes quite evident uh, in the late spring and summer when we get into these restrictions. Uh, and oftentimes they go to stage four quite quickly based on uh, the level of uh, uh, precipitation. Um, I, I would suggest that these types of developments, we'll see uh, possible in, uh, restrictions where there's no outdoor water use allowed at all. We don't understand the impact that these, uh, today, th these developments are going to have. Uh, there was a mention about the one down the street at Denny's, and there are others in the pipeline as well. Um, 
Also uh, to the uh, electric uh, supply. So there's a, a substation next to town tire that the, that the electric department is already upgrading uh, currently. And so it's, it's uh, likely that that would need to uh, it also be uh, increased uh, in capacity. So um, I really think the impact, and also the impact to the schools. So we, served, we heard 46 two bedrooms. So that, that suggests that there's going to be children in, in those units. Um, how many, it's, it's not clear. But we know at the Smith School that's uh, in the process of opening, there's some excess capacity factored into that design. But this type, these types of developments, we could easily uh, cause all this, especially the elementary schools, to quickly go to 100% capacity uh, and require uh, an another school building to be constructed. Um, in terms of the uh, affordable housing, can you uh, just mention again what, what the current uh, app what the applicant is asking or uh, suggesting? I, I think the applicant and uh, Attorney McCann, you can correct me if I'm wrong, has agreed to 12 and a half percent. All right, so uh, the affordable housing, I don't know if uh, the, uh, the public is uh, aware of, uh, of uh, where we stand today. If we are, I think, at 10, we're currently at 10.3%, and the 2020 census will come out with uh, metrics that may drop us below 10%, and that exposes us to, to 40B projects, which uh, are similar, it could look e very easily like the one that's being uh, proposed. Um, I think that's all I have. Uh, just one last thing about the uh, about town meeting. I really think that this this is the type of thing that should go to town meeting. I think there should be a moratorium for these types of projects um, until we actually have some type of master plan that maps out what we think Danvers will look like going into the future. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Additional public comment on. 51 Needham Road. Just help me out, board members. Do we see any hands? No. Okay. Oh, All right. Um, and um, can I respond to some yes, of the things? Yes, go ahead, Attorney McCann. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of things that I just wanted to respond to. Uh, a few of the comments. Uh, this is an irregular shape lot. This board has found that this is an irregular shape lot and that there is a hardship related to this property six or eight times already in the past. This board has made that determination and has granted variances with regard to this property uh, because of the legal hardship due to the irregular shape of this lot and the access points uh, at, as that relates to the use of this property um, in the past. And so this board has already granted and determined that there is a, a legal hardship associated with this property. There was a comment that this property has frontage on Route 128. This property has no frontage on Route 128 because there is no access onto Route 128. And therefore, if you do not have access legal access onto Route 128 from the site. That is not frontage. So this property has no frontage on Route 128. Um, this particular site, uh, the four acres of this, uh, of this overall site has been vacant for, for a number of years. It is an eyesore. It is almost entirely paved. And there have been a number of different, uh, that I can, uh, can tell you, folks who have called me, over the years looking to use this section of the property for a use that might be permitted in the C3 zoning district, and there is zero interest in that. Uh, if there had been interest in it, you would know about it, and it would have been going forward. Um, it, it simply is uh, a site that uh, cannot practically be used, and that is, uh, is our argument for uh, purposes uh, under the C3 zoning district that require visibility and access. And this site um, has, has just been a paved over site that's been vacant for a long time. And this use that we're proposing is in keeping with what shopping centers have become. And I went into a great deal of discussion in my application that shopping centers are permitted in the C3 zoning district. So what is a shopping center? A shopping center is now evolving into a center that has 
office uses and retail uses and services and residential. The services support the residential, the residential support the services and, and the retail. So this, in fact, is not a leap. This is a use that is in keeping with the zoning district and the uses that are permitted in the zoning district. Um, I think um, I'll just make co one comment on the schools. Um, impact on the schools is not a basis for den denying zoning relief. And uh, that is uh, something that, that this board has recognized in the past as well. I think that's it as far as my, as my comments on the comments. Thank you, Attorney McCann. Um, before we deliberate, I just want to make sure there's no additional questions from the board members. Can we just review the sign? Would that be possible? Sorry. The signage. Uh, Michael, can you go over the signage? If we could quickly, because uh, we have got a lot of cases, so if we could just quickly recap. Okay, well, the, uh, the existing sign today, uh, essentially the theater marquee and all that, is it, it, about 800 square feet, double-sided, so 800 on each side. That's correct. And what's being proposed is, is reducing that to a quarter of its current size, uh, as you can see in this rendering here. Okay. So Sorry. 200 square so feet 200 on square both feet. sides. Okay. Yes. And the height, no change. No change to the height uh, as drawn here, and I think part of that, the reasoning for that is because there's um, likely to be some kind of a sound barrier or fence of some sort along the highway, and so that, that is a useful height to have. Is that good, Becky? That's the only sign? Yes. One sign. Yeah. Oh, that, and th there is an existing point. sign that was mentioned that is uh, at the entrance to the site. Yes. Uh, that has the, the old use located on it, and so presumably the, the name of this project would be substituted for I'm that. So right. that's a lot of library. Panel. So there is a panel there, and yeah. that's where it's going to go. It's a okay. small monument sign. Yeah. Okay. Nothing on the building, nothing at the entrance to the building. <clears throat> right. Okay. All set, Becky? Yep. Okay, uh, board members, uh, we will go on to deliberations, and Bob will sat down there with you. Either we're going to make this a residential site, or we're going to make it half co uh, commercial, half residential, or third commercial. That sign on 128 is a commercial sign. It doesn't belong with residential units. As a matter of fact, you're already by Bendicott Street, and you buy the development by the time you can see the sign, and you're going 50 miles an hour. I don't know how many people are going to rent from that sign. And as Ken said, you can't have it both ways. Either it's going to be a residence or it's going to be commercial. Not a little of, of, of one and a lot of the other. Uh, I don't have a problem with the sign on Endicott Street. I don't have a problem with this project. My only issue is it's either a residence or it's not. And, and just because it happens to be a commercial sign doesn't mean you have to use it. So I won't vote for it. Thank you, Bob. Becky. Um, I appreciate the, the changes from uh, the applicant in um, reducing the number of units I, and the size, the overall size uh, of the building. Um, we need housing in Danvers. Um, I have some concerns about whether this is the right location for it. Um, and I have a lot of concerns about the utilities, the water, the electric, et cetera. Um, but I don't think that that's our decision to make. And I think somebody else with more expertise in those areas will have to deal with that. Um, so I will vote for this. Thank you. Will not. Will? Will. Thank you. <laughs> Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, in projects like this, we, you, we ask for traffic studies and whatnot. We have a whole book of traffic studies. This is to the audience as well. We're not traffic ex experts. So we go by what we've got. I mean, we can't just keep nit comment, nitpicking please. something to death. They gave us our answers. I have no problem with this. I'll Thank, for it. Thank you, Ken. Jeff. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, had concerns about the project being too high and too big, and I still have those concerns. Um, going from 140 to 130 doesn't seem that substantial to me. I will go ahead. Thank you, Jeff. Ken. I, too, I, I agree with um, Jeff, what Jeff said and what, what Bob said as well. Um, I, I wouldn't vote for this. I think it's uh, way too big. Um, and I'm, I'm not so sure we need, need the housing like that. In fact, the housing report, I thought we were pretty flat. Um, I didn't think um, there was a, a big need for this, this amount of housing. And uh, it just seems like commercial may be better in the future. I know it seems like a lot of people aren't going out now with the, to stores and stuff uh, with COVID, but I think that will change someday. And I think there's gonna be a need for brick and mortar. Um, Places and I just think it's it's just way too big. I wouldn't vote for this. Thank you, Ken. Karen. Um, I also would not vote for this. I think the project has just too many issues. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Attorney McKeon, I, I too don't support it. Although I want to just make some clarifications. Um, I do think it's too tall. I thought that from the onset. Um, I appreciate the work that was done to reduce it in size and units, but I still, I just think of that hill with a 24-foot building now, or 23-foot building, and then we're almost doubling it. Uh, that to me just seems out of place. Um, I agree with Bob. We're trying to, you know, get the best of both worlds here. We've got a commercial sign. Uh, to me, get rid of the commercial sign. I don't think you really need it. Um, and, you know, you, you mentioned relief six or eight times in the past, but it wasn't to put residential housing in a commercial lot. So uh, although I can know a relief was granted, it wasn't granted for this type of use or, uh, you know, a, a use change or a use variance. Um, and, you know, um, this, this isn't permitted in commercial areas. So, you know, this is something we're kind of doing that's unprecedented. I, I kind of agree with the public a little bit that maybe this is something more for a town meeting. However, we look at every case based on its merits. And uh, my feeling is it's just too big. Um, if it were smaller, I, I think it's, it's nicely done. I think it has a nice look, but I just think it's too big. And for that reason, I will not vote for it. So what would you like to do? Can we, um, since sign seems to be a, a big issue, um, the applicant is interested in using that sign for marketing purposes um, because it makes sense when this first goes up. What if um, we were able to have the sign decrease by 75% as we've proposed over what's there now um, and have that for a, a shorter period of time, for uh, maybe three years, um, and then we take it down and we come back to the board and we proposed a, a building mounted type of sign. Well, I, I think that could be possible, but I, I just think there's other issues that time. Well, let's, uh, well yeah, let's take that issue um, first. Is that something, and I, I guess I would ask Mr. Signetti uh, I, um, if that addresses his, uh, his concern. The sign would end in three years, is what you're saying? Yes. I could go along with that. I think that's a fair compromise. Okay. I think that sign is too tall to begin with anyway. Um, I think I could support that as well, if the sign were to go away in three years. Okay, good. Um, one, uh, the height of the building we, we've looked at, and um, really when you're talking about this corridor, the existing building, it, it, when you talk about it being 23 feet, you don't even see it. I mean, what, when you're driving along. Um, and I think Michael has done some um, analysis of this that this will look appropriate as you're driving along 128 going 55, 60 miles an hour. It will be a appropriate and the height will be appropriate for this area. And it's also, we're not asking for a variance on the height. It meets uh, the height uh, requirements. I think I stand by my comments. It's just too big. Um, I think the only other thing that, uh, that we've looked at, and we heard this and, and uh, gave some consideration to it, and I don't know if um, 
Hillary wants to discuss the affordable component, but uh, we might be able to increase the affordable component um, to 15% um, for this project, and that's, that's a significant change. Uh, we had come in with 10%, Understanding under the bylaw it doesn't require any, but of course we didn't come in with zero. We came in with 10%. Um, we could go up to 15% on the affordable component. We've come down 10 units. We've created, addressed the massing with the, uh, it's more than just the massing, but we've addressed the massing with the, uh, with the roof decks, but also the community aspect that we discussed a little bit more the, during the first meeting of this type of development. And we've created more green space in this area here than we had initially. Um, and we've created community amenity space in the roof decks um, to bring this project full circle. Well, you don't have the votes right now. What would you like to do? One moment. Thank you. To be clear, you're a, now a yes as long as the sign's gone and three. As long as it is down, yeah. yeah. There's no need of that sign. It's proper. This is uh, no. um, difficult um, because a lot of time and effort has gone into this and we really do think that this is a, an excellent project um, and the applicant and their team has really tried to work with the concerns that you've had and we think that we've made some, uh, uh, some significant changes that, uh, that really do address those concerns but this is, this is a good project for this area, and this is what can be done. And we've gone to 15% on affordable in perpetuity. We've lowered a portion of the building. Um, we're not asking for a height variance. Um, we've got um, more green space. We're, we're taking a site that's 94% pavement now and turning it into something that will be very attractive and appropriate uh, for the area. And Don't have the votes. Nope. <laughs> You're right, uh, three to two, the way I count it right now. And we need four. You need four. Um, so I guess we're going to have to withdraw and unfortunately not go forward with this project. Okay. Could I get a motion, please? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, our next case is Group 1 Realty, Inc., docket 20-4892, requesting a variance to allow the installation of a small Toyota logo sign 
on the renovated service building in accordance with section 37.5.5 of the Danvers zoning bylaws at 99 Andover Street, Route 114 corridor, Zone A. Ready for me? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Nancy McCann. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, Group One Realty, Inc. Um, I will try and make this brief. I know the clock is running. Um, the uh, applicant's representative, uh, Jeff Kleiner, was supposed to be here this evening, but unfortunately, he's quarantining. He hadn't anticipated that he would be, but uh, I will present this um, for you. It's pretty straightforward. This is uh, relative to the IRA dealership Group 1 campus on Route 114-99 Andover Street in the Route 114 Corridor Zone A Zoning District. This site has been the subject of a signage package variance over the years and most recently in 2018, the board granted um, a variance for the signage package for the, uh, for the dealership campus with the board recognizing that um, it, we have different dealerships uh, on the entire campus and they have to be adequately uh, identified. And the last time when we were here in 2018, we were separating the large existing, had been Lexus, it is now the Toyota uh, new and Toyota pre-owned building. It was separated to reduce some of the building area. And that in, along the, the Route 114 frontage. And the Toyota service became a separate building. And as you drive by there now, that building is a large white building with about 1,600 square foot facade facing Route 114 with no identification whatsoever on that building. It looks odd. It is confusing to the customers because they don't know what's going on in that building and whether they should be going there. Uh, so all we are asking for is to allow a Toyota logo of about 30, um, eight, 38, 39 square feet to be placed on that building facade that currently has nothing on it now. Um, that logo actually had been on this site. It's an existing logo that had been used previously and we, when we came in in 2018, that was one of the, the logos that were removed as we were doing a new signage package. So all we're asking for in this case is to place a logo, the Toyota logo, which is right here. No wording, just the logo, on the end of this Toyota service building that faces Route 114. And I'm sure you've all driven past it and you've seen this large white building that is now its own building. It had been attached before, and now it's a separate building. And it looks unfinished without any identification on it at all. And there are daily issues with customers not knowing what that building is and whether they should be going there or not going there or what it's related to. So group one has asked uh, that they be allowed to place a, uh, a small 38.64 square foot logo on this 1600 square foot facade. Um, it's uh, in keeping with the, the uh, signage package that the board has approved previously for this site. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Corinne, we'll start with you. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Ken. I have no questions. Yep. I have no questions. Ken. No questions, thanks. Becky. Oh. My question, what's going on in there? It's service? It's Toyota service. But they don't go to that building, right? No. They go to the next, the building over. Right. And then the cars are brought to that building. Correct. Nobody drives to that building for service, right? The customers do not bring their own vehicles. Okay. At the present time, the customers don't bring their okay. vehicles there. I, 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 I went there, and that's what I thought. OK. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Go ahead, Bob. So the only one that needs to know what's in that building are the people that work there. 
And they already know that. Well, no, the customers want to understand and people passing by want to understand what's in that. I, I represent them and I drive by and I say, what's that big white building that it's not identified at all? And it should have some identification on it, and that's what we're looking no, to do. Just to identify the building. It's not for the convenience of the customers because they don't go there anyway. Right? Well, it is in that it causes confusion when the building is not, not identified at all. Well, why would you go to a building that's not identified? All right, I have no other questions. Uh, <laughs> I don't you, have Bob. a problem with the Toyota button. Uh, Attorney McCann, so uh, this site, and I don't need you to go through the whole thing, but how many other signs are on this site? I, I'm somebody who goes to IRA. Uh, that building's always confused me as well. Um, but uh, the whole site's confusing. <laughs> well, so, hopefully it's becoming less confusing. Well, this, as there's been construction, I believe, on that entrance road uh, across from Brooksby Village Way for some time. Is that correct? No, there's not. A, I don't believe there's any particular construction going on other than, than there is construction on the Toyota certified pre-owned that was moved to connect to the new Toyota building, which that construction separated and created this separate white building that has no identification on it that had originally been con all connected. So there is construction going on on the site that has been previously. Well, where, where, so, the, for instance, the four bays that you do pull in for service, is there a sign on that building? Yes. And I, I take it uh, it's facing 114. Yes, the sign where you pull in, it's kind of facing that. That's angle, okay. Right. That's where the bays are. You should be, hopefully you can see it on your plan, where the four bays are. And then you have this building that juts out with nothing on it. And you just want to put the logo on there, to make it all look like it goes together to provide some identification for that building. So and that I know in the past we've, we've uh, granted a number of variants to deal with signage at yes. the site, correct? Uh, yes, which is actually why we would be here, because the, the building, um, if it were just its, itself, might possibly get a larger um, attached wall sign, 10% of the front facade. We're only asking for a logo that's less than 2% of the front, uh, the front facade, but this entire site signage is under variance. So I'm just curious, I mean, I see you here in March of 2018, why didn't we identify this at that time? Right, that's what I mentioned at the, the beginning of my presentation is that back in 2018, we probably should have included this in the package that we brought to you then, but the sign uh, consultant didn't do that at that time. I suspect if we had shown you this logo on this section, there wouldn't have been an issue with that. All right, uh, I have no additional questions. Uh, anybody here from the public? Mr. Bradstreet, you got something quick one? Yeah. Uh, did okay. we get the uh, problem in the Lowe's parking lot resolved since Ira had the permission to put cars there? I don't. The problem in the Lowe's parking lot, tell me. All right. When, and I know Ira gave it to Kelly, or sold it to Kelly. Mm -hmm. Initially, one of the conditions was they would not have those car trailers in there unloading cars. Oh, yes, that's been resolved. Okay, that's all I know. Thank you, Bob. Mr. Brassery, if you could, quickly. Give him time. Give him time. Give him time. Give him one of those small ones. Two minutes. Bill Bradstreet, Tom, and email for Precinct 1. If the logo is approved, would the addition uh, that no verbiage be added at any later point. It would any change they would want to do would have to come back before this board. So you consider whether the, the logo was sufficient or not at that point? Well, that's all they're asking for right now is the logo. That's, that's all I'm asking is that's it. That's it. Whatever's on the plan. Whatever's on our paperwork, yeah. Any additional questions? Hearing none. Corinne, deliberation, please. 
I will vote for this. Thank you. Ken? I would vote for this, too. Yeah. I, I will vote for this. Ken? No problem. Thank you. Um, I'm going to vote for it. I, I think it makes it con the site confusing, but I'll vote for it. Bob? Uh, since it's just a logo, I have no problem with it. Yeah, I, I think it's insignificant at uh, 38 square feet. It may help uh, Ira get people to the right spots in that monstrosity of a site. So, can I get a motion, please? Mr. Chairman, I move to grant the variance from section 37.5.5 uh, of the Town of Danvers zoning bylaw for additional signage, Toyota logo on service building for the plan submitted, the hot chip, size and shape of the lot and uh, the location of the building. I've got a motion. Can I get a second? <coughs> so, Becky, second? Okay. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kathleen, can we just wipe the public mic on? I think it's her. You're up, right? Yep. <laughs> Busy night. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you could, next case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next case is Peter and Patricia Kapusik, docket 20-4894, requesting a finding to allow the raising of an existing non-conforming accessory garage and reconstruction of the garage in, in the same footprint with no increase in square footage or building height on a non-conforming lot in accordance with section 3.17 of the Danvers zoning bylaws at 59 Lindahl Street. This is zoned R2. We have a letter of support from Joseph D'Almeida, 21 Burley Ave, Ellen Graham, 61 Lindahl, Roland, I can't read the last name, Gallagher, 61 Lindahl, oh, Graham, sorry, it's the same name. Mr. and Mrs. Joseph uh, Garudo, 60 Lindahl Street are all in favor. Very good, thank you. Attorney McCann. Thank you very much. My name is Nancy McCann. I'm here on behalf of the applicant, Peter and Patricia Kapusik. The Kapusiks are here this evening. And uh, we are requesting a finding to allow the um, raising of a dilapidated um, pre-existing non-conforming garage and the replacement of that garage in the same footprint in the same height with a new, um, very attractive uh, garage in its place. Uh, the applicants are, are the owners of the property at 59 Lindell Street, and this property has been in their family for some 68 or more uh, years. The main residence was built in 1871 um, and has been maintained by the, the applicants. The garage that we're talking about is a detached garage that comes in off of Burley Avenue. That's a little bit newer, probably 1916, 1920 vintage, but still an old garage. Um, it has fallen into disrepair, as you can see from the, uh, the photograph that we've been, uh, provided to you. And um, rather than just uh, proposing a replacement of a standard uh, type of garage, the Corpusics actually hired uh, John Duggar who is an architect, he appeared before this board uh, before, who really has a specialty in historic uh, architecture, and he has designed a beautiful garage of the exact same, again, exact same footprint, exact same location as the garage to be raised that you see in the photographs, uh, I should say the plan, uh, elevation drawing, rendering not photograph, of what is being uh, proposed. Same height, the existing garage is, uh, is 14 feet high. This garage will be 14 feet high as well. The existing square footage is 441 square feet. The proposed uh, square footage is 441 square feet. Um, so there is no increase in square footage, no increase in height. It's in the same location, no increase in the nonconformity. Um, so, uh, the applicant is requesting the, uh, the finding in accordance with section 3.17, um, and we do believe we meet all of the requirements under section 3.17 for that finding, and also 
generally that this uh, proposal is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than what's already there. And certainly, I think you would find that this would be a significant improvement. The Preservation Commission has uh, made a determination that this garage is not historically significant. And I, you already read in the, uh, the letter of support from various uh, direct abutters to the, the, the project, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Attorney McCann. Uh, Bob, we'll start with you. I visited the site, no question, you need a new garage. No <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Question. No Becky. questions. Yeah. No questions, thank you. No questions. <coughs> Okay. No questions. Anchoring. I have no questions either. I, I too visited the site and I do not have any, any questions. Any uh, in the public? Yeah, come on down if you could make it quick. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Matthew Duggan, town meeting member, precinct one. Just a, uh, a question and a comment through you, Mr. Chairman. Is the garage being used today to park vehicles? And could you respond to that? I don't think so. It doesn't look like it to me. No, not currently. No. Okay, thank you. And just a comment, uh, vehicles parked in front of the garage doors uh, blocking the sidewalk, forcing pedestrians into the roadway. Hopefully, uh, with the new garage, they'll actually park the vehicles inside and not block the sidewalk. Thank you. Yeah, I would think the look of this garage in New England winters, I'm assuming you'll definitely want to pull your car in there. So, okay. Any additional questions from the public? I don't see any. Okay. Um, come back to the board. Uh, Bob. I'll vote for this. I'll vote for this. Ken? I'll vote for this cool looking garage. Yeah. I'll vote for this. I would vote for this. Right. Um, I will vote for this. I actually love the garage too. I think it'll look <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, it, it really is a nice rendering, and uh, I look forward to driving by to see it. I think Window Hills is a real nice spot in town. So, um, could I get a motion, Mr. please? Mr. Chairman, I move to grant the finding in accordance with Section 3.17.1.2.3 uh, plus point four of the Denver zoning bylaw to allow the existing non-conforming garage to be demolished and rebuilt. There is no crease in site coverage. There is no crease in the increase in the gross square footage. There is no increase in the degree of nonconformity. The reconstruction conforms to the current requirements of this bylaw to the maximum extent possible. Uh, this garage is not substantially more detrimental than what presently exists. I've got a motion. Second. I, and I've got a second. Any if, further discussion? For the discussion, could yep. we just uh, indicate that it's the revised plan that came in October 26th instead of October 22nd? Do you have that, Kathleen? Revised drawing of October 26th. 26th. Okay. Okay. It was revised. Yeah. I've got a motion. Uh, any further discussion? It's been seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any Thank opposed? You. Thank you. Thank you. See the building inspector. Okay, folks, that uh, completes our continued cases. Uh, we're trying to move along as best we can. Again, I'm going to remind people that we will stop at 930, which is about 45 minutes from now. We're going to try to move cases through. Um, and uh, if you could, just be concise with your presentation, and uh, we'll do our best. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our next case is Michael LaRoche, docket 20-4896, requesting a special permit for an extended family living area on a non-conforming lot. 
area area in frontage. The EFLA will be 745.5 square feet in accordance with section 9.3.3.2 of the Denver Zoning Bylaws at 37 Ledwood Drive. This is zoned R2. Mr. LaRoche, when I drove by to look at your property, I said, well, he's going to take all his yard away, but then I see you really don't have a big yard anyway. <laughs> no. Okay. Tell us what you'd like to do. Identify yourself, and we'll see if we can get this. How are you doing? I'm Michael LaRoche. Um, I would like to do an in-law apartment for my wife's parents. Um, I do have an updated um, layout and a proposed. Uh, That's different than what you submitted? Um, not much. I know there was an error on the proposed. Um, Why don't you just point out that error to us? I know there was like a measurement error on the left side of the house. The I setback? Um, we have it at 14.4. The, that's the front. That's the front. The back corner, 19.2. It should have been 19.2. Can you ask Rich to go help them? That's the side setback. Yeah. Yeah, the side setback, sorry. You're at Ledgewood, right? I have a side setback of 14.4. Is that incorrect? But they're both 14. .4. Yeah, so the. Okay, so one of them's. 19.2. 19? Yep, 19.2. I have uh, copies oh, for everybody yeah. if you want them. Oh, okay. So we can correct those. Okay. So the one on the top is 19.2? Yes, sir. Okay. And that's the only change? That is the only change. And now the other setback from the rear where we have 19.5, uh, that's correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. That is correct. And the dimensions on the proposed addition have also not changed? They have not changed. Okay, correct. and you're looking to do an F one. That is correct. And I think we have it in the narrative. It's under 750. Correct? Yes, sir. Anything else you want to add? No. That's it. And it's for mom and dad. Uh, my wife's mother and father. Your wife's mother and father. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I believe it's correct. Um, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Ken. Um, what space will you be sharing with your in-laws? So we have a about 11 foot by 19 foot sunroom that would be, we were going to add a bathroom and a laundry area, a shared laundry area, and that would be also an entrance on the side of the house so they can enter through there and um, that would be kind of like the neutral point so we can do our laundry in there and it will be like a mutual bathroom space. For the entire house. And that's an existing room. That's an existing room. Could you just identify yourself? Who um, you want? Chris Caruso, Caruso Building and Design. I'm sorry, one more time. Chris Caruso with Caruso Building and Design. Thank you. Okay. All right. More? Oh, I, I don't have oh, any that was questions. Me. That was you? Yeah. All set. I okay. have no more questions. I have a question. Yeah. Thank you. Ken. No questions. Thank you. Becky? No questions. And no boy. questions. Uh, yeah, I don't think I have anything. It's just the lot size. Right. Yeah, so the lot, uh, the garage, the existing garage is going to stay, no changes there. No changes to the garage. So you're just going to have a side entrance on the left side of the house. That is correct. And is that in the proposed addition or is that at the back of the garage? That, that is at the back of the garage. Back of the garage. Yeah, it's in that existing space. Take some space. of the garage away to put this. No, the garage ends, and then there's the, um, what we'll sun call room. a sunroom. Okay, so the sunroom the goes away, combo it's bathroom, laundry now. room. No, okay. And uh, Mr. Maloney, are you good with the floor plan? Yes. Thank you. Uh, no additional questions from the board? Any from the public? No. Seeing or uh, hearing none. All right. Um, I will vote for this. Thank you. Ken. I would vote for this too. Jeff? Yeah, I will vote for this as well. Ken. I will vote for this. I will vote for this. I will vote for this. And I too see no issue with this. Uh, and this is an amended drawing um, to change that setback. Uh, could I get a motion, please? Mr. Chairman, I move that we grant the special permit in accordance with section 9.3.3.2 of the Danvers Zoning Bylaws to create an extended family living area, EFLA, 
on a non-conforming lot for the plan submitted. Uh, I, would, I would say the revised plan submitted. Uh, the municipal water and sewer shall not be overloaded by the effluent. The public street shall not become overloaded by the effluent. The value of other buildings and properties shall not be depreciated by the EFLA, the specific sites and appropriate location for the EFLA. The EFLA will not adversely affect the neighborhood. There will not be undue nuisance to vehicles or pedestrians. Inadequate proper facilities will be provided to ensure the proper operation of the proposed EFLA. The proposed EFLA will be in harmony with the general purpose of the bylaw. Second. I've got a motion to second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? See the building inspector. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Do we need a break or are we going to power through? Keep going. Let's go. How long? We have no questions. No questions, so we don't have to wait them out. As soon as you have to set. I think we're having sign night because it's Mr. Signetti's last night. Is that, <laughs> is that accurate? You yeah. know how much he loves signs. So, yeah, this is an honor for you, boss. The, the sign, sign expert. Ready? Yes, go ahead, Mr. Boyd. The next case is 72-74 Andover Realty Trust, Kathleen Cavanaugh, trustee. Docket 20-4897, requesting a variance or a modification of the prior signage variance to allow the installation of wall signage on the rear building to adequately, adequately identify the Automotive Collision Center facility in accordance with section 37.5.5 C and E of the Denver Zoning Bylaws at 72 Andover Street, Route 114, Zone A. Thank you very much. My name is Nancy McCann. I'm here on behalf of the applicant. With me tonight is Brian Kelly, president of Kelly Automotive Group. And we are requesting a variance to allow adequate signage to be placed on the Kelly Collision Center building that is located at the very rear of the property at 72 Andover Street. Um, the Kelly Collision Center, for those of you who are familiar, and you probably, most of you are familiar with the site, is located some 900 feet back from Andover Street. And between Andover Street and the Collision Center is the VW dealership. So as you're driving down Andover Street, you don't see the uh, Collision Center at all. But when you turn in and there are two curb cuts that get you to the Collision Center in the back, <coughs> as you turn in the western, the, I'm sorry, the easterly curb cut, you can't see the signage that is existing on the collision center. There is one existing sign, and it's on the westerly end. So as you pull in the easterly curb cut and you look down toward the collision center, you don't see it. You don't see the identification for it. On the other end, when you pull in on the westerly curb cut, you do see the collision center in front of you, but that signage is not adequate to get the customers to the door that they are supposed to use for the collision center. Now, this being a collision center, hopefully, these are not repeat customers. These are new customers that come when they've had a problem with their car. So they're not familiar with the site. They're sent to the site by the insurance carrier. They don't know where they're going, and we're looking for some adequate signage. So what we proposed are just simple, clear, directional types of signage. We have the existing Kelly Collision Center sign over the westerly end of the building. We're proposing to add to that an entrance arrow that points people to the other end of the building, which is where they need to go in. Then we are proposing at the other end Kelly Collision Center that you'll be able to see when you pull in the easterly curb cut that you can't see now to get people back to that building that's 900 feet back from Andover Street. And then on there we also have the um, entrance arrow and the deliveries arrow. A total square footage of this signage 
is 140 square feet. The building facade is 5,750 square feet. So it's a very small percentage of uh, the building facade, but it's very, uh, very much needed. And I'd like Brian to um, tell the board exactly what the situation is for the customers. Thank you. Hi, I'm Brian Kelly. Um, we do a lot of work for the Geico Insurance Company, and they're not our customers per se. They come from all over the place, and they don't know the location. They don't know the site. And a lot of the customers are elderly, and we find them. They get out of their cars. They walk a couple of 300 feet. They open the wrong door. It's just really confusing, and I, I didn't think it through. I thought everybody would go in the main entrance, but they're not. They're going into the entrance on the east, and the, entrance, the main entrance is on the right. And as Nancy said, you can't see the entrance. You can see the building with a sign that says Collision Center, but you don't know where to go. So it's just confusing from both ends. So I'd like to clarify that with some simple signage. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That's it. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, Bob. As one of the elderly who may be confused, um, <laughs> wouldn't it be better to put the entrance sign the one on the left there, over the entrance. It already you've, says it. No, you've got an arrow saying going this way to the entrance and another arrow going this way to the entrance, right? It's that door in the middle, it's the entrance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I tend to agree, but... Why can't we just put the sign over the entrance? It says entrance. No, it doesn't. Yes, it doesn't. <laughs> Sign over. It says entrance. Is there a sign there? Yes. Yeah. We can't see that. I drove there. Yeah. Well, I drove. There. I didn't see that. Yeah. It says entrance. Well, that's. I mean, that's maybe that sign should be bigger too. I mean, that's. Or at least problem. in red. Yeah. Maybe. The build. The building is just so flat. Not easy. <laughs> no, I. I don't have a problem. I drove by there. I didn't see the entrance sign. Maybe you should make yeah. that bright red. You can tell what's his last night if we he's suggesting more signs. <laughs> <laughs> He's been really good to me over the years. <laughs> Bob, additional questions? That's because you've been a stand-up guy. Like, like, you know, most of these auto dealers come in, we've got to put our hands on our wallet. Uh, I have no other questions. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> it is your last night, isn't it? <laughs> Becky. Um, I went there. I didn't think it was confusing. There's a sign. There's a door. It says entrance. Um, this. The buildings identified. Um, I didn't find it confusing, so I, I couldn't see the need for all of these additional signs. Any questions? No questions. Thank you, Ken. No questions. Thank you. Yeah. No questions. Ken. No questions. And Karen. I, I don't have any questions either. All right. So I, I just have one. So on the right-hand side of the building, when you pull in the westerly entrance. Kelly Collision Center is already on that end of the building. Yes. And so you're going to duplicate that sign on the left side over that garage door. Right. So you can and then see you it. want these red signs that point to entrance and one for deliveries. Got it. Yes. Uh, questions from the public? Hearing and seeing none. Bob, deliberations, please. Yeah, where that building is located, I don't have a problem with this. Uh, you can hardly see the building, don't mind the sign. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, Becky. Uh, I think it's too many signs. I would go for a bigger sign over the entrance, but I think that's all that's really necessary. So you're a no? No. And Ken. I agree with Bob. I think if the building's set so far back, I think we need the signage. I have no problem with it. I'll go for it. Very good. Jeff. Yeah, I don't think it's necessary, but it's so far back, I agree with Bob. I'll vote for it. Thank you. And Ken? I would vote for this. You're a yes? Yes. Thank you. And Karen? Um, I, I would vote for this I, if you think you need all of these different signs. I actually think the signs kind of make it even more confusing because you're driving up only to be told to go somewhere else. Um, but if I, I, I don't have an issue with the signs, so I would vote for it. Thank you. I think at 140 square feet, uh, building that large. Um, if you guys think it will work, I, I do. My comment would be, uh, and I, even though your entrance says entrance, I, I might 
glam that up a little bit, particularly um, given that that seems to be where you're having trouble pointing people to. But uh, I would vote for this as presented. So could I get a motion, please? Mr. Chairman, I move that we grant the variance from section 37.5.5 of the Town of Danvers zoning bylaw for additional signage for the plan submitted. The hardship is the size and shape of the lot, the location of the building thereon. I've got a motion. Can I get a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Passes four. Thank you. He's not going far. I should be, I should be retired. <laughs> Take care, Brian. I'll be in touch. The next case is MJP Properties, Inc., docket 20-4898, requesting a variance to allow the construction of a multifamily development consisting of an existing single-family home and a new duplex where the existing <coughs> single-family is located less than 40 feet from the existing abutting dwelling and garage, and to allow the existing dwelling to be located less than 40 feet from an existing accessory garage in accordance with Table 3 of the Danvers Zoning Bylaws at 82 Sylvan Street. This is zoned R1. Okay, Attorney McCann, um, I'm confused because I know you were just here on this. Oh, she I'm, didn't I'm going to try and... Uh, or, I'm sorry, this I, I case was, here. was before us. Yes, this case was before you. I was here. Um, and I'm going to try and make this very simple in the interest of time. What you have before you tonight is the same project and the same plan that we presented to you, a, main, a maintenance of the single family dwelling uh, at the front of the, the property along Sylvan Street uh, with interior renovations and rehabilitating that, and the uh, location of a duplex in the rear of the, the property, exactly as you had approved it previously. We so received- why are we back? We moved on to site plan approval and the multifamily special permit with the, um, with the planning board. And during the course of that plan preparation of the site plan, it was determined that the distance between the existing single family home and the single family home on the abutting lot and the distance between the existing single family home and the garage on the abutting lot isn't the required distance. And so although we talked about it and we, grant, we received a finding for the side setback, we did not specifically ask for, because it wasn't identified at that time, a variance of the di uh, from the distance between the existing single family home on the subject property and the existing single family home and garage on the abutting property as well as the distance between the existing house and existing garage. So we're uh, talking about the 24.2 and the 31.6. That is correct. And what do those numbers have to be to not be before us? The, those numbers are? 9.3 and 28.7 also. Right. Right. OK. Uh, 28.7, 24.2, and 9.3 are what we are looking at, and the requirement is 40? 40. Is the requirement is 40 feet. On all of them. On, on all of them, but it's important to note that these elements are the existing conditions. They are not being changed. Right. The proposed duplex is fully conforming to okay. the distance between abutting structures and structures on the lot fully conforming. The only reason because we're here. All more than 40. Exactly. Very the good. reason we're here is because the existing yeah. structure is now being treated as a multifamily. Gotcha. And therefore, we have to meet the 40 foot setback. We didn't specifically ask for that when we were here before. We got to site plan. They said you need to specifically ask for that. So we came back because we hadn't identified that before. So that's why we're here. Bob Griffin is here tonight. Mike Panzero is here. Um, as well, if you should have any questions, but this is uh, this is the same project and plan that you saw before. We just needed to call out two other, three other uh, 
items having to so do with existing structures. So these are dimensional variances that weren't identified when you initially, uh, when this project initially came before us. Correct. Anything Related else? to existing structures. To existing structures, not the new building. Correct. Thank new you. building is fully conforming. Anything else you want to add? No, nope, that's it. Karen. Um, I, I don't have any questions. Thank you. Ken? I have no questions. Yeah. I have no questions, Mr. Chairman. Ken. Um, thank you. I guess I'm confused about this whole thing. So the, build, the house next door, to me, which one of these houses was built first? Well, the... the I guess what I'm saying is if, if our house was built for first, they became non-conforming, not us, by building the house too close to our house. Is it, what's, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it no, no it's, it's changed the whole thing. Right. No, I get that. I so get the, that. So this 40 feet wouldn't have come into play when it was only a single thing. Right. We adding, adding this structure in the back changed how this lot got dimensions. Right. We already right. dealt no, with no it. Previously, we had done 174 Pine Street with the finding. We had the exact same conditions, where we had two existing old structures, combined the lots, added two duplexes in the back. We've got a finding from the zoning board, then the planning board moved forward with the special permit. So uh, they're not looking at it the same way now, so they're requiring the dimensional variance for the existing structure. But yet it was multi when you came before us before. Okay. Wasn't it? We approved these two units in the back? To, to make it a multi, yeah. Right. Yes. And, but then it went to planning. And they, and and they, they said, they, wait a minute. The interpretation is a little different okay. than it had been, as Mr. Okay. Maloney just now I get stated. It. Okay. No Thank further you, questions. Ken. Becky? Uh, so you didn't move anything from what we already approved. It's just that That's they're right. looking for. Okay. No questions. Thank you. And Bob. Yeah, you just, we just approved this is what you want. Yes. All right, I don't have any questions. And just to clarify, Attorney McCann, the garage, which is labeled 1A, that's an existing structure. Yes. Um, 1C uh, is a, all right, so actually that's a slab, so that doesn't even come into play. Okay, I have no further questions. Any questions from the public? Seeing none, hearing none. There's oh, a, sorry. One the back. Where are you? Come on up. That'd be good. Hello. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Tina McKay, 107 Ash Street. Um, I came to the last meeting and raised some concerns about where he was putting the fence, um, where he abutted my property. Um, I've spoken to Mr. Pandero, who's agreed to move the fence. Um, two feet in from the existing driveway to where he is um, to end it sooner to where the um, existing chain link fence ends and to taper it down and also to remove the tree because now the tree will be on the mice on the opposite side of the fence um, and the tree is over the house and dropping a lot of branches lately and two other trees in the yard have fallen recently so I asked him if he would remove the tree. So he's moving the fence and dealing with the tree? Yeah. So you're happy? Yep. Yeah. Good news. Thank you. We like happy endings. Thank you. You got it. Any additional comment from the public? Hearing none? Uh, One in come, the back. Way in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't see. I'm under, I'm, under bright lights. I'm under Fenway Park conditions up here. <laughs> That's why I, we do this as a team. We need a light on the plan, so. Yeah. I just want to say that. Uh, could you just identify who you are and your address? My name is Matt Wallace. I live at 113 Ash Street. Thank you. I just want to say that I'm for the project. Um, before this all started, my, uh, Mr. Panzero went around and asked everybody's opinion. That meant a lot to my wife and I. Um, so far, we haven't heard them working at all. Um, they've been really respectful. And um, I'm all for like the block looking nicer. That house was, you know, starting to wear because yeah. it hadn't seen some care in a while. And 
you know, I'm all for somebody picking, you know, um, cleaning it up and making it look nicer. And sure to enhance all your uh, values as well. Yep. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Any additional comment or question? Hearing, seeing none. Uh, current. Um, I did not vote for this project last time, and I definitely like to see that um, you're communicating with the neighbors and trying to get them on board with the project. So since this was passed before, I will vote for this now. Very good. Thank you, Corinne. Ken? And uh, same thing with Corinne. I, I didn't vote for this before, but the, the circumstances here, yeah, I'll, I'll vote for this. Very good. Uh, Jeff? I'll, I will vote for this. Thank you, Ken. Hey, we voted for it before. I'll vote for it again. Thank you, Ken. I will Becky. vote for this. And I Bob? Also uh, I, too, uh, revisited the site yesterday. I agree with what the neighbors said. It looks like the project's being done very well. And I'm glad the neighbor in the back is uh, resolving fence and tree issues. So all good. I, I guess, mm, Attorney McCann, more than a comment, a question. I just wonder how, is this something that um, if a project like this were to come before us again, do we now know about this in hindsight? And we will address this, and it won't have to get to site review before it gets caught. Yes, we now know about that. A somewhat changed in interpretation, and we're looking at okay. those things going forward. And this forward. is only because it went to multifamily. Correct. That's exactly it. I have it. Could I get a motion, please? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I uh, move to grant the dimensional variance from Table 3 of the Town of Danvers Zoning Bylaw to allow for multifamily multi development for an existing single family dwelling is less than. Is less than uh, 40 feet from an abutting dwelling and garage, and to allow the existing dwelling to be less than 40 feet from an existing accessory garage, as shown on the plan of record layout plan by Griffin Engineering, dated 10 14 2020, the hardship size and shape of the lot and the location of the building. There on. I've got a motion. Can I get a uh, second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. And good luck. Uh, we have two remaining cases, folks. We have 15 minutes. Uh, we're going to do our best. We have three. 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 I got oh, this we don't call you next week. Next week. <laughs> 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 I'm getting tired. It's only for my snowboard. <laughs> it's going to be You're no. earning your keep <laughs> Um, let's let it rip. Mr. Clerk, yeah. Our Are next case is James C. Gattuso, docket 20-4899, requesting a special permit to allow the conversion of a dwelling in existence prior to July 1st, 1980 into four dwelling units with no exterior modifications and a finding to alter an existing non-conforming structure for conversion from three units to four units, the structure being non-conforming in accordance with section 30.2.4 and table two, section three of the Danvers zoning bylaws at 25 Conant Street. This is zoned R1. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Nancy McCann. I'm here on behalf of James Gattuso. He is here this evening as well, relative to the property located at 25 Conant Street, with which the applicant does own. Um, we are requesting a special permit and a finding to allow the conversion of this dwelling unit, which was in existence uh, prior to July 1st of 1980, to allow that conversion from three units to four units with only interior renovations. There will be no exterior uh, renovations at all associated with this, uh, with this proposal. Um, the applicant acquired the property in uh, 2015. Um, history of this uh, structure, it was built in about 1890. It is on a lot that contains 12,631 square feet with frontage on both Conant and Chase Street. It was built originally as a single family home. It's been medical offices, it's been mixed professional offices and two families. Um, it's had. Uh, Three-family uh, conversion occurred in 2006. Under the conversion regulations, a special permit 
is allowed for a conversion of up to four units, and that is what we are seeking uh, tonight is the special permit to allow the conversion of this um, historic dwelling into four units. We do meet all of the requirements under section 30.2.4 for the conversion as I've outlined in the application. We have the required uh, minimum lot area, significantly more than required. Um, we have more lot area per unit than proposed. Um, we meet the side setback requirements. Um, the dwelling was in existence in on July 1st of 1980. Um, we are not proposing any changes uh, to the exterior of the building. We do have the required parking spaces under Section 30, um, and the property is located in the R1 zoning district, which uh, permits this use. We also meet all of the general requirements for special permits under Section, six, uh, uh, section 30, I should say, as outlined in the application. Um, we are seeking a finding uh, to al allow the alteration of the structure, which is located 16.3 feet from the front setback where 20 feet is required. But we are making no changes to the structure. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I'll keep it brief at this point, but uh, you do have a photo. I submitted photographs of the structure because there are no exterior changes being proposed. You do have a plan showing the parking uh, and the layout of the site, and I did provide you with floor plans. Thank you, Attorney McKinnon. I'll start down there with you. Uh, actually, sorry, before we start with Bob, can you just explain the significance of the July 1st, 1980 date? Yes, under uh, Section 30.2 of the Zoning Bylaw, uh, structures in existence, uh, dwelling structures in existence, uh, as of July 1st, 1980, are eligible to come before you with the application that we have for conversion. And that's a town of Danvers bylaw? Yes. So if this was a single family at that date and time, it could change to up to four units? It did, didn't have to be a single family at that time. It had to be a dwelling structure in existence as of that time. And then it can go from up single to multi? up to four units. As long as it's in R1? No, it can be in any R. Uh, any zone. And no. No. one, two, and three? Or one and two? Only in R1. It's only in R1. R1, that's what I thought. You yeah. can get a conversion from a one to a two in res two and res three, only only occupied with 50% right. of the... Yeah, the, but you, you the can get a conversion in the other districts. on the res Correct. two and res three. So okay, but R1, no restriction as R1. owner R1. occupied. Correct. Okay, I yeah. just want to understand that date. Uh, go ahead, Bob. Yeah. I don't have any questions. Thank you, Bob. Becky? Uh, is anyone living there now? It's totally vacant right now. It needs it's vacant. Fire, needs fire sprinklers. Could you identify yourself, please? So James C. Gattuso, owner. Um, Would you go over to that one? Uh, There's a microphone. Uh, James C. Gattuso, I'm the owner. Uh, no one lives there right now. Um, it needs fire sprinklers. Uh, being converted to four units, so in order to put the sprinklers in, it has to be totally empty. Okay, I mean, because it looks kind of messy outside. Yeah, yeah, I bought it from foreclosure, and it's always been that way. So this uh, renovation well, hopefully will give it a. Five years, right? Say it again. You've owned it for five years. Um, about that, I would say the first year and a half or so was very, uh, probably close to the first two years was very hard with police calls and me talking to Rich trying to get the property stabilized. It Can was you a talk big. Talk slower, please. Sure, I was just saying, when I bought it, I bought it out of foreclosure. Yes. And I would say like the first two years were all evictions, trying to clean the building up and just getting it like restabilized. But in order to do this uh, renovation, we need sprinklers and in order to put the sprinklers in, it has to be empty. So how long since it's been occupied? The last person moved out like two months ago. Okay. And I have a question on this floor plan. Sure. So it says unit one in the basement. So it's a split unit. The first floor is split between the front half of the building and the back half of the building and the whole basement. Okay. That's why it says unit one and two on the first floor. That's correct. So unit one is partially in the basement. That's correct. Three bedrooms are going to be in the basement. That's correct. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Becky. Uh, Ken, I have no questions. Uh, Jeff. I have no questions. And Ken. Um, what about parking? You're going to have um, another unit, so is there adequate parking? Yes. The uh, <coughs> Section 30 requires two parking spaces per unit, unless the Board of Appeals wishes to make that fewer. Uh, we are showing the two parking spaces per unit. You see eight parking spaces on the plan. All right, so you have eight. All right. Oh, yeah, there it is. All set. Thank, Thank you. you, Ken. Sure. I just have one question. How do you get into these parking spaces? Is there, where is, where is the cutout? Oh, on Chase Street. It's okay. All right. That's what I thought. Okay. No other questions. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, Attorney McCann, so the building's laid out currently as a three? Yes. And uh, how are we creating the four? Is it the third floor's turn, uh, becoming the fourth unit, or is it the split first and second floor? Our first unit and second unit, I guess. Basement. Uh, he's first. utilizing all uh, three floors plus the basement. Yeah, uh, but, and but how is it laid out right now? I'll ask uh, Jim. So can you go to the microphone? We're on the cable. Sure. So it's all three floors are like the third floor unit is one floor, the second floor unit is uh, one floor, and the first floor is one floor separate. The so you get in a fourth unit by splitting the first floor and adding the basement. Right. If you look closely at the picture, there's a porch on the side of Chase Street, and that actually has like a huge like staircase that goes up to the second floor entrance. So the second floor has like a multitude of entrances as well as the first floor. So the first floor has three entrances, one on the Conan Street side that looks at the church, one where the porch is on that Chase Street side, and then one actually on the back door. Where the parking is? Yes. Okay. The parking and is huge in the, in the rear of the yard. Yeah, I visited yesterday. Um, it also allows the creation of a small unit, which is needed in downtown. Uh, that unit two is a one bedroom unit. Yeah. And um, well, it, is there a plan to like clean this property up? I mean, it's like random chairs out in the yard. I well, mean, it's a real disaster. I as, as the applicant said, he's got to uh, really gut this building to create uh, in interior renovations only, but uh, to put in the spring. The sprinkler system, excuse me, <clears throat> to put in the sprinkler system, and uh, he's going to be putting a significant amount of money into this building. And yeah, it's going to be cleaned up, and then you four nice units available for rent. Okay. He has to go through site plan also. He does go to site review for this, okay. Um, and then one more question, Attorney McCann. The 16.3 foot setback on Chase Street, that's the one that has to be at 20? Yes. And are we at 20 on Conan? 16.3 uh, is, is the closest point, and I believe we are. Uh, so we've asked for the dimension to the closest point, which is 16.3. I think I see 31 on the uh, plot plan. Is that right? And then we have the porch coming off of that. But the porch doesn't have a setback, right? I think the porch does count as a setback. Uh, Rich, is that porch part of the setback? Front staircase and porch? Not the stairs. Well, on, on one or two families, they're exempt. So this is exempt? Well, well the structure's not conforming. The, the setback of the structure has nothing to do with the conversion. Okay, got it. So she, the, the finding is mute. She doesn't need a finding for the structure. It's a, provision, a special permit provision says nothing about non-conforming structure. Got it. If you get a structure and the conversion's inside of it, it doesn't matter how, you know, how big the, the lot size matters, but the structure does not. Okay. Any additional questions from the board? Hearing none, I'll go to the public. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Matthew Duggan, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 1. A question and then a comment. Um, in terms of the parking, will the existing uh, uh, impervious surface be uh, utilized or will it expand into uh, more of the kind of grassy area 
at the rear of the building. Do you have to respond to that? I don't believe it will expand. This was a, this parking uh, area, parking lot was approved back in 2005 when the initial conversion to three units went in. And there's eight spots, correct? Eight, correct. Very good. So okay. no change in, uh, in purpose. Right. So it's, it's a, a significant increase in the number of vehicles that, that will be there. So um, I would just ask the applicant to consider uh, adding some landscaping, some arborvitaes or something to, to separate that lot from uh, the property at 3 Chase Street um, to kind of uh, break it up a little bit. So yeah, and, and again, uh, Mr. Duggan, this will go in front of site review, so okay. that may be something they... Right. And then okay. just one last comment. This uh, property has been an eyesore for many years. I've lived on Chase Street for more than 20 years. And this site has always been kind of a transient type uh, property. So uh, I think the neighbors are looking forward to a new day where uh, this uh, will be kind of a, you know, a gateway. It's a gateway into the back bay. So, yeah. Um, I, I agree. Uh, it's a nice one now, and it sounds like the applicant's going to clean it up. All right. Well, I wish them luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Additional comments? Hearing none, I think I started with Bob. Bob, thank you. Yeah, I'll vote for this. Becky. Um, I'm, I'm not comfortable with all those three bedrooms and an office area, plus a bathroom in the basement. Um, I... I would be more inclined to consider this if the property were in great shape. Uh, the applicants owned the property for five years, and um, I'm not I'm not in favor of this. Thank you, Becky. Uh, Ken, I will vote for this. I'm sorry, you will I will. Thank you. And uh, Jeff, I will vote for this. And uh, Ken. <laughs> I would vote for this too, but yeah, in the basement, all those bedrooms, I'm sure there's going to be proper uh, uh, protocol with f for fire alarms and, and uh, ways to get out and stuff. Uh, I know there's, sorry, I, well, the, Mr. Maloney, you can attest to that. I mean, I'm sure everything will be up to code and stuff because um, it seems like a little dangerous there if there's no, you know, these illegal apartments and stuff in the basements and there's not enough, uh, there's no windows and uh, adequate uh, fire escape type of uh, you know ways to get out and stuff. So I'm so I would vote for it with uh, you know condition that everything is up to snuff. But I'm sure it will be. Just want to make that comment. Thank you, Ken. Karen? Um I would vote for this. Thank you. Uh, I agree with Becky. Uh, I think the applicants or owner, I should say. Um, should have had this property, and even even if it was just dressed up for us to do our site visits on. Um, however, it's an opportunity here. Uh, I think and hope the applicant will take the opportunity to make this property. It's kind of a grand building to me, so I hope you address the outside. I, I don't know if I would rent that basement unit. Um, however, uh, I see no problem with the conversion, so I would vote in favor of it. So, uh, and I hope site review ferrets out the landscaping issues, particularly given the, the spot you are there. And if they don't, maybe you'll do it voluntarily. So, uh, could I get a motion, please? I move to grant the special permit to convert the three-family home into a four-family in accordance with section 30.2.4 ABC put in D of the Xenia Zoning Bylaw for the plan submitted. The municipal water and sewer shall not be overloaded by the conversion. The public street shall not become overloaded by the conversion. The value of other buildings and property shall not be depreciated by the conversion. The specific site's an appropriate location for the conversion. The conversion will not adversely affect the neighborhood. There will not be undue nuisance to vehicles and, and pedestrians and adequate and proper facilities will be provided to ensure the proper operation of this conversion. The proposed conversion will be in harmony with the general purpose of the bylaw. I've got a motion. Could I get a second? I'll second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Uh, it passes four to one. Uh, we need a finding as well. Or, he said we didn't need a finding. Do we need the finding, Rich, or no? 
Do we need a finding or we not? We do not need a no. finding. Even okay. But, uh, but if you look at the chart, I don't want to get to the board. You guys can arm wrestle in the office, but I'm here <laughs> and we don't need a finding. <laughs> you think we need it, Attorney McCann? Right so. I'm just looking. Dwelling conversion has a uh, front yard setback of 20 feet required, and we don't have that. We have 16. 20 feet per parking. <clears throat> no, it's not here. Why don't we do a one part finding? No. Uh, this conversion is not substantially more detrimental than what presently exists. Just do a second vote, let's go. Uh, I think we are saying, yeah, we'd like to have the finding. Okay, just we've got case. a motion on a one part finding. Could I get a second? A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay. Thank Four you one. Very much. Got it. Have a wonderful holiday, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. you too. Thanks, Bob. You too. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Yes, we do. Uh, is anybody here on 6 Mill Street? He's over there. Okay, I'm sorry, sir, but uh, I'm. We can do it. Uh, for it. You guys are killing me. It's, it's after 9 30. Right, I'm going to read. We uh, <laughs> have to be home by 10. Donato Cabuzzi. <laughs> Docket 20-4900, requesting a dimensional variance to build a dormer on the right side of the house. The dormer will be in the, in, in the existing footprint. The setbacks will be 2.6 feet at front and 3.1 feet at the rear corner in accordance with Section 7, Table 2 of the Denver Zoning Bylaws at 6 Mill Street. This is zoned R1. Hello, I'm Don Cabuzzi. I'm uh, kind of inherited this two family that I'm... Uh, Remodeling. Can you like just come a little closer to the mic? We can't hear you. I'd like a permit to uh, a variance to put a dormer on it rather than make the footprint larger on this to make a two family. So. so you're looking to add dormers on the right side of the house, correct? Exactly. That's all? Oh, full shed dormer on the right, but two uh, regular windows on the uh, facing Water Street. I can't hear a word you're saying. A full shed dormer on the right hand side. A bulkhead? From, from left full to shed. front full to back. Shed. And then on the other side of the house, a couple uh, just regular windows, dormers. Okay, well, your application doesn't say anything about the shed. Am I? That's the dormer. The shed dormer? dormer. Shed the dormer. Dormer. It's a shed dormer. Thank you. Okay, do you have anything else you want to present? No, no, nothing else. Mr. Kabuzi, I was by your site yesterday. I'm kind of surprised you guys are working on a Sunday. You know, we're not supposed to do that, right? That's, that's, he's not on the site plan. It's the one and two family. Okay. Only site, we only regulate hours of work on, on project, commercial projects that are on the site plan. Very good. Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, so I think I'm going to Bob. I have no questions. Thank you, Bob. Becky. I have no questions. Ken. No questions, thank you. No questions. Ken. No questions. Karen. I have no questions either. Okay, this property looks like it really needs some help. I uh, also have no questions. <laughs> Same footprint yeah. changes. So Brad Street, you good? I think that's Mr. Duggan back there. Yeah. We're all good, guys. <clears throat> back to the board. I'll vote for this. Thank you, Bob. I'll, I'll vote for this. I know Mr. Kabuzi, and I've seen some of the other things he's put together, and I think he can fix this. I <laughs> <So laughs> think Val's next door is getting done as well, right? Yeah. That's it. Uh, Ken. I will vote for this. Jeff? I will vote for this. And Corinne, uh, sorry, Ken again. I would vote for this. Yep. And Corinne? I will vote for this, and it will be nice when it's done. Great, uh, thank you. I do you. see no issue with this. Uh, I hope it turns out well. Could I get a motion, please? I move to grant the variance, uh, the dimensional variance from Section 7, uh, Table 2 of the, to of the Town of Danvers Zoning Bylaw to add a shed dollar as shown on the plan submitted, the hardship size and shape of the lot, undersized area and frontage, 
in the location of the existing building on the lot. Second. I've got, a, I've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Yep. Governor Baker calls me. <laughs> and one of our own, too. Our last case is Jeffrey Sauer, docket 20-4901, requesting a variance from front setback to erect a 10-foot by 12-foot shed in accordance with Section 7, Table 2 of the Dam Zoning Bylaws at 450 Locust Street, the zoned R3. Is there uh, anybody here on 450 Locust Street? Tonight. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, could you state your name and your address, please? Uh, Jeff Sauer, 450 Locust Street. I want to put up a shed. And that's the size of it? Well, I I really need a place to put my snowblower, so it would be nice to put the shed somewhere near the front. And uh, my lot is somewhat unusual in that my front lot line is not at the street. It's actually almost 30 feet back from the street to begin with. Uh, I have a ditch in front of the house that's actually owned by the town. So although I'm requesting a variance to bring the shed up to within 13 feet of the front lot line, it's actually almost 40, 50 feet back from the edge of the curb. All, you know, Because of the ditch. Because of the ditch. I got you. Um, if you've been out to the lot to look at it, it's all staked yeah. off and you can see where it goes. And because of the topography, it's almost impossible to put it anywhere else. Is that the size of it? That's it. And if we didn't have these cars in your garage, would you need this shed? Or? I want the snowblower out of the garage, yeah. Some more cars? Yeah. For more cars, okay. Karen, let's go to you. I do not have any questions. Ken? Um, no, I have no questions. Come on, Ken, you gotta have something for this out. <laughs> Come on, dig deep. It's a classic topography problem. You can't put the shed right at the end of the driveway, correct? Right. With that, yeah. I have another question. That was a pretty good question. That's Becky, you gotta have something. You need to designate somebody. Um, so, who, did you talk to your neighbors? Yes, actually, the neighbor that's closest to the shed, I was worried because they his, have a shed. his shed is actually illegal. But Ooh, it was more what? than 10 years. I checked with, with Rich, Rich. It's more than 10 years old. So oh. it's, it's grandfathered in, so it's fine. So, uh, but it, my shed's going to go very similar to where his is. On, on and my how block. big is his shed and how big, and compared to your shed? It's Here's about the same size, 120 square feet. Your shed's at the limit, right? Yeah, I'd like a bigger one, but then uh, there's no way I can get it 30 feet back. So Thank you for staking it out so we could see where it goes. Nothing else. Thank you, Becky Bob. And that's not your shed that's there, right? No. Bob, this is important. It's your last vote. Yeah, Bob, you're going to make this good here. Oh, wow, wait a minute. Now. I would deny it maybe <laughs> just based on that. Is that your shed or your neighbor's shed? Okay. That's the neighbor's. <laughs> no, I don't have any questions. We'll go out to the public. Uh, uh, Kathleen, I uh, appoint uh, Corinne to vote on this. I think she likes Jeff less, so <laughs> it's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> Anything, gentlemen? Nothing. We will come back to the board and uh, deliberations, Corinne. I will vote for this. What? I, I went out to the property. I saw it staked out, and I saw it's going to abut the other shed, so I think that's a great location for it. I, I would vote for this. Thank you, Ken and Ken. Um, I'm on the fence on this one, <laughs> but I will vote for it. Hey, and Becky. Yeah, if you didn't have so much stuff in your garage, you'd have a little That's what I'm snow. <laughs> I would vote for this. And Bob, your last official <laughs> vote in 27 Whoa, years. No. Um, I'll vote for this. Not a problem. That way I get to go to the Christmas party. Good point. Good point. And Mr. Sauer, I don't say that. I, Mr. Sauer, I, I no, fully, no Christmas uh, party this year, actually. I oh, fully I believe you married the right girl because she allows you to have all these cars in your garages. So um, I would too vote for this shed to Thank allow you. you to get some more cars in. So. Could I get a motion, please? Uh, I move to grant the the, the uh, dimensional uh, variance in Section 7, Table 2 of the Town of Zambasoni bylaw to add a shed on the front. Setback is shown on the plan submitted. The hardship is the topography of the lot. 
and the property is at the base of a steep hill. Second. I've, I've got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Good luck and see Thank you. the building Good luck, inspector. Good luck, Mr. Sauer. Could I get a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Second. Bob, and again, uh, on behalf of this board and the town, thank you for all your years. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Motion to adjourn. Thank you, everybody.